Chapter 281. What the Wind Swept In, 2. Maple Castle was located on the western border of the Whipper Kingdom. Sha wind brushed past the top of Choi Han's hood. The chilly winter air was gone, and a slightly warmer air was surrounding Maple Castle, however, it still felt like winter at Maple Castle. So the king threw us away. Hey, talk quietly. Why should I be quiet? There's no need. The only thing we trust are the things we accomplish with our own two hands. Choi Han who had been stealthily walking around the corridor stopped walking after hearing those voices. It was not a regular winter for Maple Castle. The king had chosen not to give a speech and officially declare war. Thanks to that, the atmosphere around Maple Castle felt as if you were standing in the middle of an extremely cold area. The people who had to face this coldness started to slowly show a single emotion. I will follow Commander Tunka Nim until the end. Hey! Forget the Mogoru or Mugoru or whatever they're called. Do you know what I had to do to get here? Aren't you in a similar situation? Of course I know. I know very well. A venomous intent. The soldiers were starting to turn evil. This was only possible because the Whipper Kingdom's wars had originally started from a civil war. Oh. Choi Han and the soldiers made eye contact at that moment. Hello, Priest Nim. Hello, Priest Nim. The expressions on the soldiers' faces quickly changed to that of respect, as if they had never had that evil look in the first place. Choi Han slightly bowed his head to greet the soldiers before starting to walk again. Choi Han, it's different than how I imagined it would be. Choi Han remembered what Kale had said on their way to Maple Castle. Kale had seemed to be happy about something as he was smiling. I think the Whipper Kingdom's people are more rational than I expected. The soldiers are angry at the king and the empire, but they don't seem to have gone crazy. Kale's eyes had been sparkling. It was as if he was happy that he had originally come just to work but now he could do it with more sincerity. The Whipper soldiers are all properly trained warriors. Who do you think would win if they fought against the empire's soldiers? Choi Han looked back toward the soldiers who had greeted him. Their hearts were full of maliciousness, however, they had not gone mad. They were all looking toward the future. These people had won against strong enemies like the mage faction already. That was why Choi Han had been able to answer Kale's question without any hesitation. The majority of the Whipper soldiers have less than two years of training. Their system is less than three years old and is awkward as well. The Empire's soldiers would be properly trained in their system that has lasted through their extensive history. But I believe that the Whipper Kingdom's soldiers would win in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Training was important in a battle where your life was on the line, however, there was something else that was more important. You're right. Choi Han, they have no fear. Kale agreed with Choi Han's answer and happily smiled. Although Kale did not seem conscious of it, he seemed to be relieved. Choi Han thought about that memory and raised his head. The teleportation magic circle installed in Maple Castle. This was where the soldiers had teleported into Maple Castle, but the Whipper soldiers who had personally felt the usefulness of magic were actively avoiding this area. The soldiers chose practicality even when they knew it would make them inconsistent. Pot. The teleportation magic circle lit up. A number of people wearing white robes soon appeared. Long time no see. Elf Pendrick who was covering his elf ears, as well as some of the sculptor assassin Frisia's subordinates had come. Frisia and the Sun God twins remained at the Empire. Choi Han looked around. The expressions on the faces of the soldiers lit up at the appearance of new priests. They were even happier knowing that Pendrick, a priest with healing abilities, was coming. Choi Han started to speak to Pendrick and Frisia's subordinates. Please follow me. The people who were here as priests to heal the soldiers followed behind Choi Han. Tap, tap. Choi Han walked down the stone path toward the castle wall as he thought about his conversation with Kale. Do I not need to do anything during this war? Choi Han could not reveal his black aura. Why wouldn't you do anything? Kale who was in his priest robe responded back with a shocked expression. Is saving people not work? Kale casually threw a bag with potions inside to Choi Han. Even without healing abilities, we need to heal the warriors and soldiers with potions. We'll probably be pulled in many directions as soon as the battle begins. We will be very busy, so stay focused. All Kale got back was a blank expression. Do you not want to do it? There was no way that was the case. No, not at all. I will definitely do it. It was more difficult to save people than kill people, however, 
saving people suited Choi Han's style more. Choi Han would not fight during this war, however, he would be saving people. That weighed heavier on Choi Han's heart, is it really okay for me to not fight? That question floated in his mind for a bit, however, he soon realized there was no need to think about it. Choi Han looked up once he stood in front of the staircase that led up to the central tower of the castle walls. Rosalind. Rosalind who was wearing a mage's robe and had a smile that was as bright as the sun on her face was also standing there. Behind her was Mary who was wearing a brown robe unlike her usual choice of color, as well as a few others who were covering themselves up as well. There were also some people who were not covered up and stood there while looking only straight forward. These were the mages originally from the Whipper Kingdom. They were now citizens of the Roan Kingdom and were only looking at Rosalind's back. The soldiers around them looked toward the mages with complicated expressions. Anger, fear, hatred, gratitude, and relief. These gazes held all sorts of emotions behind them. However, the mages' gazes were stern. Fight in the war. The way that their gazes were focused on one thing made them seem like swordsmen standing there with their swords drawn. Rosalind looked toward Choi Han and flicked her chin toward the staircase. Shall we go? Yes. Choi Han and Rosalind started to walk up the stone staircase together. Choi Han felt the presence of the people following behind them and started to think. Although he could not fight, there were his friends he trusted to do it for him. And, Choi Han raised his head. Tap. 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 Many footsteps were heading toward one direction and Choi Han heard a voice as soon as he arrived at the top of the stone staircase. You're all here. The white-haired Kale greeted them while leaning on a ledge. This spot has a good view doesn't it? They could see the tens of thousands of troops at the distance behind Kale's back. The Mogoru Empire's forces. They were aiming for the Whipper Kingdom's Maple Castle. Damn, there are many more than I had expected. Choi Han started to frown. One hour ago. The Empire's forces had arrived in front of Maple Castle. An oppressive wind was blowing in from them. That wind was putting Maple Castle on full alert right now. The Whipper soldiers were clenching their weapons and giving off venomous vibes while smiling toward the priests and showing complicated expressions toward the mages. Their conversation was no more than something to help relax them. Boo Kale stopped leaning on the ledge. Tunka and Harrel were at the tower as well. Chief Harrel made eye contact with Kale. The Empire is making a move. That trumpet sound had come from the Empire's side. They could see a person standing in the front of the Empire's forces. Harrel immediately started to speak. Duke Hooten is leading the Empire's forces. Duke Hooten. The Imperial Prince's right hand man and the Empire's only swordmaster. He was the one leading the knights. Boo. They could hear the neighing of horses along with the trumpet sounds. Shit. There's a ton of knights. Tunka started to frown. It quickly turned into a smile. His name is Duke Hooten? I can rip that human into pieces. Kihihihi. <laughs> Duke Hooten had not taken part in the last battle of Maple Castle. That meant that the Empire was being serious this time. Boom. 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 The ground started to shake. It was not because of magic nor anything of the sort. It was just that tens of thousands of soldiers were moving along with the cavalry behind them. This is no joke. Rosalind started to frown. Swordmaster Hooten. It was not that she was afraid of him. This is even more than the Parun Kingdom. The three northern kingdoms. Knights numbering close to the amount of knights from the land of soldiers and knights were currently raising their swords and spears toward Maple Castle. However, there was something different about these knights than the knights of the north. The armors of the knights are all fortified with magic. They all have at least a high-grade magic stone in them. Rosalind informed the others on top of the tower, the Empire. Why was it called the Empire? Rosalind recalled the information she had learned about the Empire when she had been next in line for the throne. Her teacher who had taught her about royal traditions and politics had stopped a lesson for a moment to tell her something. An Empire must be better than average in all aspects. It refers to a nation that is above all others when combining all aspects together. You must remember that. The Roan Kingdom was above average in magic. The Parun Kingdom was above average with their knights. There were many nations that were talented in one area. Above average magic, above average troops, above average strength of knights, and finally, the continent's only home for alchemy. Rosalind recalled the weight of the empire that she had forgotten about. 
They are scary because all of those aspects are gathered together. The Empire's knights alone were not scary, the Empire's magic was fine to take on by itself. Even the Empire's alchemy could be handled if you were cautious enough. However, her teacher had warned her. You may hate me for saying something like this, however, I am telling you this because you are someone who is going to be a ruler. The Empire is a nation where everything is above average. A kingdom that is below average in any aspect would not be able to defeat the Empire. Her teacher had finished off by saying the following. You will thoroughly realize that if you become the Empire's enemy. The Empire that was actually serious this time had brought knights that were at the level of the Parun Kingdom's knights with magic armors that had high-grade magic stones, something the Parun Kingdom would not be able to do. Boo then the Empire's Mage Brigade appeared from behind the knights. This Mage Brigade had a longer history than the Rhone Kingdom's Mage Brigade. Chief Harrel let out a scoff. They brought all this just to take back a castle? Harrel could sort of understand the Whipper Kingdom's king's fear. Anybody would be scared after looking at these troops. They truly came, not just for Maple Castle, but to gobble up the entire Whipper Kingdom. Harrel completely understood the Empire's true intentions. He also realized that the Empire looked down upon the Whipper Kingdom and didn't try very hard during the last battle. Boo the sound of the Empire's trumpets cut through the battlefield. On the other hand, Maple Castle was completely silent. Soldiers and warriors were already in formation at the castle walls since about an hour ago. Their pupils shook and clouded over for a moment. The venomous aura they had around them seemed to disappear a bit. It was because of the large number of knights and mages led by Duke Hooten. They felt pressure that was incomparable to what they faced in the last battle for Maple Castle in the Pillar of Fire. Fighting against that many mages alone would be hard enough, so can we win against them when they have so many knights as well? Some of them were having these kinds of thoughts, it was at that moment. Ah! Boo a shout that drowned out the trumpets could be heard. At the same time, they could see their commander leaning over the ledge of the tower. Ah ha 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 ha. The commander was swinging the iron club in his hand while laughing. His eyes seemed like those of a madman. The soldiers all returned to their original gazes after seeing this. That craziness in Tunka's eyes was infecting the soldiers. There was a way for the weak to defeat the strong. The way to do that was to go crazy. There we go. Kale commented while looking at Tunka. He then slowly walked toward his group. Rosalind started to speak. It looks like the Empire will march forward soon. We will head to our stations now. It looks like I should head to the chiefs as well. Harold quickly added on. Kale calmly responded to the two of them. Watch until the end first. Excuse me? It was when Harold asked in confusion. Boo another blaring of the trumpet could be heard, and the ground started to shake. Harold looked toward the enemies in the distance. Kale was looking at them as well. There's still one more left. Mages and knights. That was not the end. Kale recalled the palace that was falling because of the terrorist attack when he went to the Empire. Kale's shield had supported the large tower that was falling. However, someone else took over in the middle in order to prevent it from crashing down. Alchemists. They had created a new pillar in the palace to support the roof. Kale recalled that unique way of using alchemy. That was why he had contemplated prior to this battle against the Empire. Would the Empire want a short battle? Or would they try to drag it out? They would want it to be short if they were aiming for Maple Castle, but they would want it to be long if they were aiming for the Whipper Kingdom. Boom. 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 The ground started to shake. Dirt pillars started to rise up from nothing, similar to the pillar that had supported the roof of that palace in the Empire. One by one. The combination of alchemists and mages that had supported the palace through Sir Rex's group's terrorist attack were revealing similar large and sturdy pillars into the world. Rosalind gasped as she commented on it. They are as tall as Maple Castle. These pillars had shot up as high as Maple Castle. Alchemists and mages were standing on top of these pillars. Knights and soldiers were gathered underneath each pillar as well. Their formation seemed to be one that could take care of both long-range and short-range attacks. Harold subconsciously started to mumble. It looks like another castle has appeared. This now became a battle between two castles he suddenly felt as if he could not breathe. The Mogoru Empire was ahead of the rest of the Western continent in terms of military might, magic, and technology. The true appearance of the Imperial Prince who had pretended to be a good person was finally revealed. Kale started to speak at that moment. 
Good. That's what I wanted to see. He sounded as if he was waiting for the Empire to come out like this. Harold, as well as everybody else on top of the tower, looked toward Kale. However, Kale ignored their gazes and put his hand on the shoulder of someone wearing a robe. This person was covering themselves completely in a robe similar to Mary. Kale took off the hood that was covering the person's face. A middle-aged man's shaking pupils appeared from underneath the hood and looked toward Kale. Kale had prepared for this war against the Empire as much as he had prepared for the war against the Indomitable Alliance and their alliance of three kingdoms and two tribes. It was even possible that he had prepared more for this war against the Empire than for the Indomitable Alliance. Kale looked down at the middle-aged man in front of him. Now, do you understand why I called you here? Kanel, the chief of the Flame Dwarf tribe. He was looking up at Kale. The dwarf chief Kanel felt chills while looking at the indifference on the priest's face. The cold commander in front of him did not even believe in a god, however, his pupils had no signs of fear. He did not seem to fear the empire nor the war. The chief's shaking voice started to speak. Do we have to destroy alchemy? The flame dwarf tribe's chief could see the priest smiling brightly as if he had said the answer. It was so bright that it gave him chills. Chapter 282. What the wind swept in. 3. Boom. The alchemists and mages created another dirt pillar. Kale didn't need to see the battlefield to know what was going on. The alchemists and mages had appeared to support the roof of the palace when Sir Rex and his group had used magic bombs to blow it up. They had scattered some unknown fluid which responded to the alchemists and mages' mana and had shot up into the sky. Then the alchemists put a black thread of unknown origin around the pillar. Once the black thread disappeared into the dirt pillar, it had turned into a sturdy black pillar. Kale was only looking at the flame dwarves as he started to speak. An alchemist's job is to always come up with something new. Boom. The black pillar continued to become larger until it turned into a tower. The towers continued to grow in number until there was a total of seven towers. The mages and alchemists would get to the top of these towers and launch long-range attacks from there. Boo Kale looked toward the dwarf chief through the sound of the trumpet. Alchemy. The alchemy of this world was similar to alchemy on Earth. Their goal was to create gold. However, the methods to do that were different. The alchemist of the western continent sought to use natural elements to create gold. That was why these alchemists could not help but become close to mana which had the purest natural element. But according to the dragon half-blood, the alchemy that the white star is looking for is not aiming to create gold. The ancient dragon Arahabin's voice could be heard in Kale's mind. Do you know why they are researching dead mana? Dead mana bombs. That was completely unrelated to alchemy if their goal was to create gold. However, the White Star's alchemist's bell tower had partnered with the Empire for around 20 years to research dead mana bombs. I originally thought that they just wanted dead mana bombs to use as weapons, but I realized that I was wrong after hearing what the dragon half blood had to say. Kale had never seen the ancient dragon looking so serious. Arahabin had a shocked yet fearful expression on his face as he explained. What the alchemist's bell tower wants is mana, not gold. Kale stiffened up after hearing that as well. The reason they research dead mana. They want to create mana. Water, fire, wind, earth, and wood. Mana exists like each of these five basic elements of nature. It was one of the foundations for power in the world and they were a group that was trying to create mana. After hearing about that from the Dragon Half-Blood, I learned that the Alchemist's Bell Tower is a higher-ranking organization than Arm. Kale completely understood. He could not figure out what the crazy White Star wanted, however, that bastard had done all sorts of crazy shit, and creating mana was just one of them. What would happen if that crazy bastard who would even attempt to create a Chimera was able to create mana? It'd become a total mess, there would be no chaos like that one. That was why Kale made up his mind once again. He was going to completely destroy the alchemist's bell tower. This was the first step to getting that done. Kale looked toward Kanel, the chief of the flame dwarf tribe, and started to speak. He could see the shaking pupils in the chief's eyes. Yeah, I get it. I'm sure war is scary for you. Kale tried to be the calm and collected commander and tried to speak with a majestic air as he understood what the flame dwarf chief might be thinking. However, Chief Canel's reaction was strange. Chief Canel, what are you looking at? Canel was not looking at Kale, but behind Kale. Someone urgently rushed toward Kale at that moment. 
It was Choi Han. Kale Nim. He seemed to be in such a shock that he called out Kale's name. At the same time, Canel's mumblings reached Kale's ears. Canel was currently scared. The king, the king of beasts, says, What? Kale quickly turned around. He could see the battlefield as he heard Choi Han's voice. It is the lions from last time. Kale could see a few people flying to the top of the black tower made by the alchemists using flight magic. Two of their faces were familiar. Kale Nim, they are the ones we saw up north. They had seen these lions when they had visited guardian knight Klopa Seka's house to steal the crown. Those arrogant lions had ended up kneeling in front of Choi Han's blade. They were currently not in their berserk transformation as they had appeared from within the Empire's forces. Nobody would have realized it if Choi Han, Kale, and the Flame Dwarves were not there. C. Commander Nim. Chief Canel's expression became desperate. The lions were talented in leadership and adept at large group battles. Unlike the tigers who lived alone in their own mountain, the lions lived in large groups in order to maximize their strength. Commander Nim, those bastards are stronger than the B. Bears. The lion tribe even has two potential successors for the Lion King position in this generation. They are super strong. Flame Dwarf Chief Canel's eyes could not stop shaking. If the Bear Tribe was the ones who had annoyed the Flame Dwarf Tribe in arm every day, then the Lion Tribe was the ones that treated the Flame Dwarves as if they did not even exist. They considered themselves the greatest tribe and considered the Dwarves to not even be worth their gazes. It was kind of true. The Lion Tribe was like the Whale Tribe on land. The Tigers could be the best if they did not have the tendency to be alone, however, the Lions who lived in a pride were considered to be the strongest. I didn't expect the lions who didn't appear with the indomitable alliance to appear with the empire. The flame dwarves became extremely scared after seeing the empire's might as well as the lion tribe. Why? The Rhone kingdom and that swordmaster, even the commander Nim. None of them can join this battle. This would be a war without the main characters for victory in the last war. This was like fighting without any limbs, commander Nim. The dwarf's expression did not look good. He had already chosen to be on Kale's side. He had chosen to join this side in order to survive. In that case, they needed to win this war. We need to make it a defensive battle. I will go work with the other dwarves waiting in the castle to build tools for defense. Rosalind had brought Mary, some flame dwarves, and some mages to the tower, however, there were still plenty of flame dwarves inside of Maple Castle. They were probably busy right now building tools for defending the castle like putting together more of these wings. The chief bit down on his lips while thinking about the dwarves who would be working hard to complete these wings without knowing about the empire's strength and the lions. However, the wings were useless in the current situation. Commander Nim, it is useless to take care of just the alchemists right now. The lions, mages, and knights that are fortified with magic, those tens of thousands of soldiers are going to invade. The flame dwarf chief was afraid. How could they defeat so many enemies with less than 5,000 on their side, especially when the Whipper Kingdom had so few warriors? The only way to survive was to lock up the castle gate and resist. Rosalind agreed with that statement. Rosalind was the only one who could openly fight along with the Whipper Kingdom's forces. That was why Rosalind shared her thoughts as well. He's right. Young Master Kale, we need to choose safety first. She looked toward Tunka and continued to speak. She thought about Tunka as well as the native warriors on their side. Their armors and weapons were terrible compared to the Empire's knight's equipment, and as they did not have any magic fortification, it was as if they were naked compared to those knights. I'm sure you agree with me, Commander Tunka and Chief Harrell, we need to preserve the number of warriors on our side. They needed to defend first and lower the enemy numbers before sending the soldiers and warriors out when they saw an opening to launch a counterattack. They needed to use the Flame Dwarves and Mary's strengths during that time as well. That is the only way to reduce the difference in numbers. This is the only way to effectively defeat the Empire's overwhelming numbers when we are fighting without our limbs. Rosalind's analysis was blunt. She looked toward Kale with that blunt and cold gaze while the Flame Dwarf Chief looked toward Kale with fear and urgency. It was at that moment, peeved, someone started to laugh. Rosalind's eyes opened wide. Commander. Tunka was laughing like a maniac who had a screw loose. Rosalind and Chief Canel did not get angry at Tunka's actions. It was because he was not laughing at the two of them. Chief Harrell was smiling as well. 
There was also one more person who was smiling. Young Master Kale. Kale was also smiling with them. He could not help but smile at this feeling that he had not felt in a while. Rayon, who had been quietly invisible for a while, asked Kale in confusion. Human. What is going on? What is going on? It was making him think about the past. Long before Kim Rock Su was a team leader, the newly employed Kim Rock Su had gone out to take care of some business with his team leader when they were beaten to a pulp. Naturally, they had failed their mission. Kim Rock Su had spoken to his former team leader when they were both still on the ground in pain. Team leader. Ah, listen to that tone of yours, you bastard. What is it? When do you think we will be able to fight using overwhelming strength? Do you think it is possible? I don't know. Don't talk about the impossible. That's too bad. What is? Kim Rock Su had thought it was too bad at that time. His company was always lacking manpower and had to fight against large organizations or strong individuals even though they were weak. That was why they never had enough strength. Kim Rock Su had never fought against an enemy while possessing overwhelming strength over that enemy. That was why he had said the following to his former team leader. My style is to cause a damn ruckus with overwhelming strength. You crazy bastard. Crazy bastard. His former team leader's voice brushed past Kale's ears. Kim Rock Su had been disappointed at that time, and that disappointment continued even when he followed in the footsteps of his team leader and became the new team leader. The Empire was in possession of an overwhelming advantage. Miss Rosalind. Kale looked toward Tunka and Harold. He then turned toward Rosalind and continued to speak. Do you know what makes the Whipper Kingdom so scary? Excuse me. Rosalind asked in confusion while one of the mages who came with her responded back. He was one of the mages who had escaped from the Whipper Kingdom. He calmly answered Kale's question. The Whipper Kingdom is scary because there is no defense. There is no defense? Does that mean, they don't ever defend their castles? Kale started to speak while the Flame Dwarf Chief and Rosalind stood there in confusion. The Whipper Warriors have magic resistance. Ah. Rosalind gasped as she remembered that fact while the Flame Dwarf Chief's eyes opened wide from this fact he just found out. Some of the Whipper Kingdom's natives were born with magic resistance. That number only grew as time went on. It increased significantly after the Magic Tower conducted their cruel human experiments. Tunka was someone who was at the peak of those individuals. His physical strength was overwhelming, but his magic resistance was even greater than that. Armor that is fortified with magic. It was just like regular steel to the Whipper Kingdom's warriors. They had innate abilities that allowed them to resist magic for a while. That was why they could charge forward without any fear. Even if the Empire happened to be caught off guard last time, the Whipper Kingdom's forces had still fought against the Empire's knights and mages during the last battle at Maple Castle. And they managed to win. The overwhelming difference in number? Why did the Empire need to prepare such a large number of troops in order to conquer the Whipper Kingdom? It was because they knew they needed at least this much to be victorious. Chief Harrell who made eye contact with Kale started to speak. Defense is not in the Whipper Kingdom's dictionary. Kehi. Kahahahahaha. Tunka's laughter shook the tower. He could see the Empire's forces. The Lion Tribe and Alchemists were not stepping up, but the knights and soldiers who were wearing armor fortified with magic, as well as the mages, were prepared for battle. However, Tunka turned his head and looked toward Kale. Kale nodded toward Tunka. Do not worry about your back. Tunka understood what Kale meant with that nod. That was why he started to move. In fact, he jumped off the tower. He laughed as his large body flew off of the tower. Kahahahahaha. His crazed voice reached both the Empire's forces and the Whipper Kingdom's soldiers. These soldiers did not have magic resistance like the native warriors. They watched their leader fall from the tower. Boom. Tunka landed on the ground with a loud noise, outside of Maple Castle. He was now face to face with the close to 100,000 troops from the Empire. He could also see Duke Hooten in the distance. Kihihihi. An overwhelming difference in numbers? Had that not been the case when they went up against the mage faction? It had been even worse back then. They had nothing when they went up against the mages. However, he had won. No, we won. Tunka opened his mouth and shouted out loud. Open the gates. Defending? Staying cooped up and defending the castle? They wouldn't ever do something like that. Screech. The castle gate opened. 
The warriors who were just as crazy for battle as Tunka appeared from behind the gate. Soldiers were following behind them. There were only a minimal number of people staying back to guard the castle. The rest of them were giving off either a venomous presence or a crazed look as they followed behind Tunka. Tunka remembered what Kale had told him before Choi Han and Rosalind had arrived. He looked down at his waist. There was a small but sturdy pouch securely tied on him. There was a small marble inside the bag. All of the soldiers had one as well. Young Master Kale. Rosalind noticed the pouches on the sides of the Whipper Kingdom soldiers as they headed toward the Empire's troops. She flinched and looked toward Kale, who picked up one of those marbles and started to speak. Arahab and Nim worked very hard. The marbles were filled with a fluid that was the same color as Rayan's eyes. He turned his head and looked toward Flame Dwarf Chief Canel. You'll be able to see it soon. The Flame Dwarf Chief flinched at Kale's gaze. He had not been able to see Kale's gaze clearly because he had been shocked by the Lion Tribe. Kale's pupils were not shaking at all. The commander confidently continued to speak. You'll be able to see just what you need to do. We need to get rid of alchemy. Kale continued to speak as the chief thought about that. You'll also be able to see how the weak are able to defeat the strong. The flame dwarf chief's body started to shake. The Whipper Kingdom's forces seemed weak compared to the lion tribe that ignored the flame dwarves and the empire that was showing its overwhelming strength. The Flame Dwarf Chief, as someone who had always been a weakling, felt his fingertips starting to shake. There was a way for the weak to defeat the strong. What is that method? Going crazy and fighting without looking back. Canel subconsciously gasped after seeing Kale's gaze. However, Kale had turned his head. There were times that you needed to run while only looking straight forward. That was the case for the Whipper Kingdom right now. Kale started to shout as he knew how the Whipper Kingdom must be feeling right now. Priests, start moving. However, honestly speaking, both the Whipper Kingdom and the Empire had the wrong idea. Mary, you go back inside the castle as well, go gather the flame dwarves. People on the tower started to quickly move. Kale was at the center of those people as he observed Tunka who was heading toward the Empire and addressed Choi Han. Choi Han. Yes, Kale Nim. Follow me. There would be no need for the warriors and soldiers to worry about their back as Kale had told Tunka. Human, I will go to save people as well. I will go with you no matter what you say. This was because Kale had prepared some overwhelming strengths for it. There's no reason Kale Henatus, no, there is no reason that I need to fight as I had fought when I was Kim Rock Su. The fire of destruction started to twirl on top of his palm. Chapter 283. What the wind swept in. 4. The dwarf was the first to react to the fire of destruction's rumbling. Dwarves were a race that dealt with steel. As someone who could not live without dealing with fire, Canel gasped after seeing the fire on Kale's palm. It was different than the fire he used to melt steel. All he could feel was a wicked fire that seemed to want to gobble everything. Commander Nim, Chief Canel called out to Kale, however, Kale just glanced at him before starting to walk. Choi Han, who was dressed as a priest, lowered his hood and followed behind Kale. Is it okay to just leave him like that? Choi Han asked Kale with concern. It was obvious he was talking about the flame dwarf chief who was blankly standing there. It's fine since Mary went. Kale coldly commented that it was fine since Mary already went to gather the other flame dwarves. And that punk will move soon as well. Kale sounded certain as he said that. Kale headed down from the castle wall and entered the staircase to head back into the castle. He turned back around and looked out past the castle wall before descending down. He'd be stupid to just stand there after seeing that. Choi Han also turned to look. He then followed Kale and headed for their destination. Behind Kale and Choi Han's back was Tunka who was charging toward the Empire's knights with just a club in his hand. Bong. The iron club and swords created loud noises as they clashed. Kihihihi. The vice captain of the Mogoru Empire's Third Knights Brigade. He started to frown after hearing the laughter through his helmet. I didn't expect that he would suddenly dash out like this. He knew that Tunka held the title of the Whipper Kingdom's strongest individual. He was also the commander for this battle. Normally in a battle like this, both sides would try to gain the psychological advantage or start with a small clash between the leaders. There were usually some formalities and class to start things off. However, this barbarian commander didn't care for any of that he just immediately charged toward them. Go take him on. 
The glorious swordmaster Duke Hutton, the captain of the First Knight's Brigade as well as the commanding officer of the Empire's Royal Knight's Brigade. He had ordered the Third Knight's Brigade to handle Tunka and the warriors who charged forward without any strategies. Teach that wild calf the strength of the Empire. The members of the Third Knight's Brigade were wearing armor fortified with magic and riding on horses. The vice captain scoffed while seeing Tunka running toward them without a horse. War was not child's play. That was why they were looking down on this barbarian who was rushing toward them without any support. However, the vice captain's face had a frown that could not disappear. How was he so stupidly strong? He could feel a strong vibration from his sword that was fortified with magic once it clashed against the iron club. The vice captain almost dropped his sword. It was not just Tunka's strength that was scary. Tunka's ability to jump up to his level when he was riding on a horse was shocking. Where is he? The vice captain tightly grasped the shaking sword and caused aura smoke to rise. Maybe high grade experts can condense aura smoke but not aura in solid form. It was the moment aura smoke was spreading out from the sword of this high grade expert. Bong. Ah. Uh, the vice captain's eyes opened wide as his helmet started to shake. His neck was then jerked back. Someone was holding onto his helmet. He 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 he. The vice captain could see the barbarian leader smiling with his teeth showing. Crackle, crackle. Electricity started to come out of the helmet. The magic spell that was imbued in the helmet along with enhanced durability was causing these currents to protect its owner. It did not matter. The vice captain's pupils started to shake. He soon heard something that sounded like thunder by his ears. Crackle. This out of this world strength ripped the helmet apart as if it was a piece of paper. The destroyed helmet slowly fell off of his head. Shaw wind brushed by the vice captain's face. The barbarian leader who was standing on the back of the vice captain's horse let go of the helmet. Clang. The destroyed helmet fell to the ground. The knight froze up after seeing Tunka's crazed face and glaring pupils. He he he, Tunka's hand grasped the vice captain's neck. Magic sparks flew out of the armor as he did that. However, Tunka did not feel a thing. Why, you barbarian? Let go of our vice captain Nim. Another knight rushed toward Tunka. Even though he was just an average knight, electricity was flowing out of his sword because of magic enchantment. However, his sword could not reach Tunka. Bang. Ah. Uh, a large bodied woman's spear parried the knight's sword. It was Pelia, Tunka's left hand woman and the tribe's greatest spear user. She was the one who parried the attack. The electricity did not affect her either as she also had magic resistance. It was not just her. The Whipper Warriors had all charged toward the Third Knight's Brigade. Although they only had leather armor and simple weapons with some of them just fighting with their bare hands, they all had no hesitation as they charged into battle. These crazy barbarians. The knight who had tried to rescue the vice captain became anxious. They were smiling. Both Tunka and his left-hand woman Pelia were smiling with their teeth showing. Kahahahaha. Tunka's laughter shook the battlefield. Boom. 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 Behind Tunka and the warriors. The soldiers who had not entered the fray just yet were hitting the ground with their spears and causing the ground to rumble. These soldiers seemed as if they were celebrating one of their festivals that had been deemed to be barbaric, as they were breathing heavily from the excitement. None of them are sane. They were different than the Whipper Kingdom's forces from last year's battle at Maple Castle. They seemed to be even crazier than that time. This was especially the case for their leader. Ah. Uh. The vice captain was suppressed before he was flung off of the horse. The barbarian leader took control of the horse before glaring toward the knight who had tried to save the vice captain. The knight found it hard to breathe as Tunka stared at him. However, Tunka was not looking at him, Commander Tunka. The knight flinched and started to shiver after hearing the voice coming from behind him, he was relieved at the same time. Duke Hudan, the Sword of the Empire. Duke Hudan had slowly approached Tunka while riding his horse. His voice was calm, however, the arrogance in his voice that showed that he did not consider Tunka to be his opponent was clearly visible. It's been a while. I feel like it was just yesterday that I saw you in the Empire. Where is he? Tunka did not seem to care about Hudan. Hutton's eyebrows twitched but he calmly continued to speak. He could be this relaxed because of his strength. Who are you looking for? Hee <laughs> hee. Tunka laughed at Duke Hutton's question and wet his lips as if he had found a prey before answering the question. Aiden. I'm talking about Aiden. 
This was followed by a moment of silence. Only Tunka continued to speak. Where is that damn coward Aiden? Aiden. The Mogoru Empire's imperial prince and the future king. Tunka was calling his name as if it was the name of a random thug. The Empire's forces seemed to be in shock. And one more person. Chief Canel from the Flame Dwarf tribe was standing on the castle walls with a blank stare. Hey coward, stop hiding and come out. I'll crush you with my fist. Kahahaha. Tunka's shout. Coward, stop hiding. Tap. Tap. The Flame Dwarf chief slowly started to move. His body was starting to get farther away from the battlefield as he took some steps back. He could hear Kale's voice in his head. You'll be able to see it soon. You'll be able to see just what you need to do. The Flame Dwarf chief took a couple more steps and finally let out a breath. Who? Duke Hooten also let out a deep sigh. However, there was anger in his eyes. Commander Tunka, I am following proper etiquette right now. No matter how strong Tunka may be, Duke Hooten could still see how strong Tunka was. That meant that he was stronger than Tunka. He had been maintaining respect and following proper etiquette as the stronger person, however, he started to get angry after seeing Tunka show no respect at all. Etiquette? He he he. Tunka just shrugged his shoulders and started to laugh. He recalled the conversation he had with Kale at the tower before Choi Han and Rosalind arrived. I'm sorry I just seem to be receiving without giving anything this time, is there anything you want? Tunka could see Kale being shocked at his question. However, he soon returned to his usual calm expression and answered back. It's not enough with Duke Hooten, how disappointing. Tunka could not help but think Kale really was a strong person pretending to be weak. Who else could say such a thing while looking at the Empire's forces? The Imperial Prince. Drag him into this muddy into this pit of fire. We can't be the only ones to take a hit this time. Tunka liked that answer very much. That was why he sneered at the Empire who feigned following etiquette and being respectful in front of the public while threatening the Whipper Kingdom and being greedy for their land in the back. You should have brought that Imperial Prince bastard if you were aiming for the Whipper Kingdom. Tunka, who had been standing on the horse, suddenly shot forward. Bong. A loud noise could be heard. Knights were blocking Tunka's path. There was a wall created by the knight's swords. Tunka looked toward Duke Hooten behind them and continued to shout. I'll let you roll in this mud, no, in this pit of fire. You bastards will have to stand on even ground with us. It didn't matter if someone was a noble, king, emperor or anything else. None of it mattered if you beat them up. Our whipper kingdom is not weak. Tunka's shout filled the battlefield. It reached everyone's ears. Kale laughed saying Tunka has got a loud voice while Dwarf Canel who had been stepping backward clenched his fists and turned around before starting to run. He was heading away from the battlefield and heading into the castle. Bong. The wall that was made of five swords broke at the same time. Tunka ignored the blades hitting his body as he moved forward. If there were people above him, if there were people stronger than him, then he just needed to pull them down to his level. They were all the same when they were standing on the ground. Magic. Aura. The only thing given to a human at birth was their body. Tunka was someone who had fought against nature and developed his body. He had no fear because he trusted this body of his, and now, he didn't have to watch his back either. Clang. Duke Hooten took out his sword. His aura shot out as well. Although Tunka had magic resistance, he did not have aura resistance. Defeat was the only possible ending for him. Ung the first knight's brigade that consisted of the strongest experts started to let out their aura smokes. They were all at minimum high-grade experts. They raised their swords toward the warriors behind Tunka. Then the captain of the magic brigade shouted from behind them. Prepare for the first wave of attacks. The mana around the empire's mage brigade started to rumble. Duke Hooten looked toward Tunka who was running in a straight line toward him and started to laugh. Commander Tunka. Your warriors will die at our knight's hands while your soldiers will die at our mage's hands. The warriors with magic resistance would be dealt with by the knights while the soldiers without magic resistance would be killed by the mages. The horse Duke Hooten was on started to rush forward as well. Bang! Duke Hutton's sword and Tunka's iron club clashed against each other. Slash! The iron club was cut by Duke Hutton's aura. This was the law of nature. The strong suppress the weak. Duke Hooten lightly swung his sword around as he asked Tunka a question. Can you feel the direction of the wind? 
the wind was blowing from the empire toward the Whipper Kingdom. The spring wind travels from the empire to the Whipper Kingdom. The western continent's spring winds always traveled from the west to the east. Tunka picked his sliced club back up and rushed toward Duke Hutan. Bong. The moment the sword clashed against the sliced club, Duke Hutan smirked toward the barbarian whose hair seemed worse than a lion's mane and whispered to him. You should have just thrown away eighty years, one hundred thousand slaves for eighty years. Hutan removed one layer of his pretense, it was at that moment. What bullshit spring whines. Kihihihihi, he could hear Tunka's laughter. He could feel the wind at the same time. There was a different wind than the spring winds that were blowing from the west to the east from the empire to the Whipper Kingdom. Duke Hutton's gaze headed toward behind Tunka. The wind was blowing. The wind was blowing from Maple Castle. The wind was blowing from inside Maple Castle to the outside. Screech screech he could hear some weird noises as well. It sounded as if some old machines that had not been used in a while were starting to move again. It was almost like the sound of a gear that had been off returning to its spot. That sound could be heard along with the wind. Kahahaha, it's here. I knew it. Tunka laughed and then glared at Duke Hutan as if he wanted to rip the Duke into pieces. My back is strong now. Kahahaha. Shaw a rough wind ate up the naturally flowing spring wind and changed the flow of the wind. It was now going from the east to the west. The wind that was blowing from the empire to the Whipper Kingdom had instantly changed directions. However, the empire's forces could not even feel the wind that was blowing toward them now. Something was floating up. Something was floating up from the center of Maple Castle. White birds started to rise up from Maple Castle. These white birds were completely made out of bones. They were flapping their bone wings and causing the wind. They looked toward the largest of the birds. The white skeleton bird that had highest grade magic stones at multiple spots around its body opened up its half folded wings. Someone was holding onto the reins on that bird. One of the lions on top of the black tower subconsciously shouted out Chief Canel, why is that dwarf bastard over there? Canel, the chief of the flame dwarf tribe, was the one holding onto the reins. He had headed from the castle wall to where the other tribe members were making the wings. He had heard what Tunka had said. Hey coward, stop hiding and come out. Our whipper kingdom is not weak. What Kale said also repeated itself in his mind. You'll be able to see it soon. You'll be able to see just what you need to do. Chief Canel grabbed the reins to control the white skeleton bird with one hand while clenching onto a video communication device with his other hand. The flame dwarves that were controlling the other four white skeleton birds looked toward the small chief's back. The dwarves were tiny compared to the size of these white skeleton birds. The person on the other side of the call talked to their chief who was on the largest bird. Do not worry about your back. The chief looked behind him. He looked toward the highest spot on Maple Castle. Their commander was looking at them from that spot. The direction of the wind had changed. The wind will bring the fire with it. The commander's voice disappeared along with the wind. Chapter 284. Without front or back. 1. Skeleton birds. The largest bird was about 15 meters in length. The large birds made out of bones unfurled their wings. Their wings blocked the sunlight. A shadow fell over the Empire's knights. That's. Duke Hutton turned his gaze toward the sky and then looked back forward again. He he he. As the Duke unsheathed his sword, the barbarian who had been blocked by a wall of knights burst into laughter. Tunka looked like he was dying of laughter. However, Duke Hutan couldn't laugh along as he looked at Tunka's expression. Five in total. Four birds rose up together along with the one large bird in the center. Duke Nim. Behind him came the urgent voice of one of the Empire's mage. This is the energy from highest grade magic stones. Those are bones embedded with magic stones. The leisurely look in Duke Hutton's eyes changed. There was no urgency, however. There was a look of sharp fury in his eyes. He observed the barbarian, Tunka, who was looking at him and started to speak. Flame dwarves and magic stones. It was probably the flame dwarves who had assembled those bones together. Hudan knew the face of that flame dwarf tribe's chief. As an excellent swordmaster, if Hudan concentrated his aura into his eyes, he could see the face of that dwarf in the sky that the other knights could not see. After all, would it make sense if Duke Hudan of the Empire didn't know the face of the leaders affiliated with the Indomitable Alliance? The flame dwarf chief who wasn't supposed to be here had appeared. 
In addition, there was a skeleton that was moving through magic stones. There was only one thing missing from the equation. Mages. Anger was visible on Duke Hutton's face. The Whipper Kingdom was a place where all magic was supposedly eradicated. He was not talking about the Whipper Kingdom's mages. Duke Hutton looked past the barbarian warriors who were laughing at him and focused his gaze. It seems like the Breck Kingdom dared to interfere in this battle. The Flame Dwarves were captured and taken prisoner by the Breck Kingdom. Flame Dwarves were weak in creating magic devices, yet those bastards were able to create a bird like that? That was impossible without the help of mages. Duke Hutton's gaze headed toward the top of Maple Castle's walls. He could see a woman at the center of the walls who was openly making her presence known by stirring the mana around her. That woman, Rosalind, was looking down at Duke Hutton. Is this the Breck Kingdom's decision? Hutton's voice was quite loud after being amplified through his aura. It was so that Rosalind, who was standing above the castle walls, could hear him. Tunka was no longer the focus of his attention. The Mogoru Empire which had built up its strength over hundreds of years was not afraid an enemy like the Whipper Kingdom that did not have an established history and just ran wild with someone like Tunka as their leader. However, things changed if the Breck Kingdom entered the fray. Hutton could see the smile appearing on Rosalind's lips. Rosalind then responded cheerfully, matching the bright smile on her face. We are mercenaries. What? Hutton couldn't help but blankly question her statement. He could then hear Tunka's voice. I hired them. Commander. Hutton turned his attention back to Tunka. Tunka snickered with a look that seemed to say, What are you going to do about it? I hired some mercenaries and bought the dwarves from the Breck Kingdom. Such nonsense, it was utter nonsense. Rosalind, who was banished from the Breck Kingdom, was technically free from the Breck Kingdom's rules. In addition, if the Whipper Kingdom had bought off the prisoners of war from them, then the Breck Kingdom would have mentioned it to the Empire out of formality. That way they would be able to say that they didn't support the Whipper Kingdom and play off the exchange as a mere transaction between kingdoms. Are you telling me to believe in such bullshit? Hutton suddenly started to speak to Tunka in an unrestrained manner. It was your imperial prince who spouted bullshit first. Tunka gritted his teeth as he glared at Hutton. A correspondence demanding a slave transaction. That was the biggest bullshit out there. Hutton snorted and looked towards Rosalind as he started to speak. Rosalind, you and the Breck Kingdom have a lot to explain to our Mogoru Empire. The Breck Kingdom who dared to support the Whipper Kingdom and point its blade at the Empire must explain today's occurrences to the Empire and bow down to them as an apology. That was the weight of going against the Empire. Hutton could see Rosalind's smiling lips parting to speak. Her voice that was infused with mana rang out. Prepare to attack. Hutton's expression hardened. At the same time, the sound of a group of people swiftly climbing up the stone steps of the castle wall could be heard. Clack. 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 Their attires symbolized that they were mages. Robes of all colors started to appear on top of Maple Castle's walls. Furthermore, these robed mages were channeling their mana as if they were ready to fight at any moment. None of them has the same outfit or even mana on the same wavelength. Everyone was prepared to channel all of their individual abilities they stood on top of the castle walls. Their numbers were small. However, the few soldiers who remained to defend the castle looked at the mages and suppressed their complicated emotions. The soldiers of the non-mage faction that rose up to destroy the magic tower and kill all the mages didn't know how to respond to the native Whipper Kingdom mages that came to help them. The same went for the mages that came to help toward the soldiers. Although the mages that belonged to the magic tower had committed terrible deeds, the fear induced by the crazed group who killed them was still lingering on these mages' minds. It was at that moment, everyone, pull yourself together. The chiefs in charge of the military operations began to travel back and forth across the castle wall. They were the ones who received orders from Chief Harrell and Kale. The soldiers could hear their voices. The empire holds above average magic skills. There are many of them as well. The soldiers subconsciously turned toward the mages after hearing those statements. The chiefs around the wall all said the same thing as the soldiers looked toward the native Whipper Kingdom mages. However, the Whipper Kingdom's mages are here. Those words were enough. The kingdom with the greatest magical combat abilities on the western continent. Although the Rhone Kingdom may have that title now, it belonged to the Whipper Kingdom in the past. The Whipper Kingdom had powerful mages who were known to be unrivaled on the entire western continent. 
the ones who knew that the best were neither the empire nor the other kingdoms. We know their strength better than anyone else. The Whipper Kingdom's soldiers who were the only ones to have fought against those mages knew that best. The chiefs started to shout. Everyone, focus and stay in formation. The soldiers immediately turned their attention back to the battlefield. Duke Hooten glared at Rosalind, who was leading the mages. Are you planning to do something that you can't take back? Duke Hooten spoke to Rosalind as Red Mana began to be melded by her hands. She then started to speak. What kind of idiot kindly explains themselves to the enemy? Rosalind, who had the proud face of royalty despite abandoning the crown, shouted toward Duke Hooten. At the same time, a voice started to speak in her mind. Rosalind. The human says to start, begin. Ung. Um. Highest grade magic stones started to cause ripples in the air as they floated up from the Maple Castle walls. The mages that had come from the Rhone Kingdom had followed military orders impeccably during the war up until now. However, Commander Kale had said something different to the mages who had come here for their break. Don't you think it would be nice to run wild and free at least once? After observing Tunka, I think the people of the Whipper Kingdom are strongest when they are free. That's right. One mage mumbled to himself as he recalled that conversation. Our commander Kale is right. Everyone here were loners. Whether it was because they hated what the magic tower was doing or because they were in agony, all of them had fled from the magic tower and lived away in seclusion with those who didn't belong to the mage faction. Nevertheless, the mages couldn't let go of magic and had to conduct their research while living in poverty or in solitude. Those mages had gathered in the Rhone Kingdom and coordinated with each other in preparation for war. Although they became strong as a group after abandoning their lifelong loner lifestyles and coordinating with each other for two years, they weren't able to use their individual powers to their heart's content even a single time since the start of the war. However, they could do that now. Ung the trains of the mages' robes fluttered in the wind. They raised their hands. Their specialty, offensive magic spells, soon left their hands. Bang. 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 The sound of consecutive explosions could be heard. Shield. The Empire's mages cast shields and blocked the magic attacks. The Empire versus the Whipper Kingdom. It was a fight between several hundred on one side and less than a hundred on the other. However, the soldiers could see it. Again, they could see the looks in the eyes of the native Whipper mages as they pulled up their sleeves and prepared their next spells at Rosalind's order. There was no fear in their eyes, even when they were against the hundreds of enemy mages. That was something they held in common with the Whipper Kingdom's warriors. The mages seemed excited as the spells they had trained in solitude shot up into the air again. Duke Hooten shouted at that moment. Attack! The second mage brigade which was standing behind the first mage brigade that put up the shield shot out long-distance magic spells that they had been preparing since the moment the shield went up. Mages on the towers, start your attacks as well. The high-grade mages on top of the black alchemy towers started to attack as well. Bong. The magic spells from the Empire's side exploded. The ones that hit the incoming Whipper Kingdom spells exploded mid-air, causing the area to shake and causing gusts of wind to blow. Duke Hutton's expression contorted. The flame dwarves. Screech the birds made of dead bones opened their mouths and let out strange sounds. These birds surrounded in layers of white bones that looked like birds from hell were flying quickly. Hidden deep within the white bones where no one could see was the black-colored dead mana that was lumped together and beating like a heart. These were the flame dwarves, Rosalind, and Mary's masterpieces. Chief Connell heard a voice in his ear through the video communication device. Block it. The chief raised his voice as he pulled on the bird's reins. Strike. Bong. The largest skeleton bird drove its body into the two black towers. Bang. Bang. Bang the four skeleton birds followed suit and struck the other black towers with their bodies one by one. Ah. My mana got disturbed. The high-grade mages on top of the black towers had to recompose their wavering bodies. However, their spells had either been cancelled or flown in random directions. A total of six towers were shaking. Canel quickly retreated from the two towers that he had struck and stared at the sole tower that had not shaken. The high-grade mage on that tower was not casting offensive magic. He was instead continuously creating shields, it was as if it was more important to protect someone there than to attack. Canel could see the one person being protected by the shield. It was a member of the lion tribe. 
The lion tribe had treated the dwarves, specifically the flame dwarves, as if they did not exist in this world. Canel made eye contact with one of those lions. The lion's golden hair that was like a mane, was fluttering in the wind. How dare these flame dwarf bastards, the lion's face contorted. Chief Canel recognized that bastard. That lion was Edrich, one of the candidates to become the next Lion King, and next to him was Gronica who supported him. Edrich and Gronica. Those two were the ones that Kale had encountered in the north at Klopa Seca's residence when he stole the White Crown. Edrich glared at Chief Canel as they made eye contact. Do you think you can win with such a crude object? You're just a damn dwarf. You must have a death wish. Chief Canel subconsciously clutched the reins that he was holding onto after he saw the murderous look in the lion's eyes. Kale's nonchalant voice came through the video communication device at that moment. That lion bastard is always so noisy. Grin. The corners of Canel's lips started to go up. Kale's voice returned as Edrich started to frown at Canel's smile. Lions can't fly. However, you flame dwarves are flying in the sky right now. The wings did not fail this time. Although the results were not out yet, Canel was certain because Kale gave the order to begin. Fly up when I give the signal. That order was conveyed to both Canel, who was in the sky, and Rosalyn, who was on the ground. Rosalyn entrusted Tunka to the knights for the time being and made eye contact with Duke Hooten who was looking at the mage brigade. Duke Hooten was wary of Rosalyn. The Whipper Kingdom used magic twice so far, however, Rosalyn had not used her magic even once during those two attacks. Ung however, more and more red mana gathered around her. The bewitching red glow swayed around as if it was waiting for the right moment. That barbarian is also too relaxed. Tunka did not seem to be giving it his all, as if he was waiting for something to happen. What could it be? Duke Hooten subconsciously passed his hand over his scabbard, it was something he did whenever he was troubled. Duke, I plan to swallow the Whipper Kingdom this time, as well as the Karo Kingdom if the chance arises. Imperial Prince Aiden's ambitions passed through Duke Hutton's mind. I'm a bit concerned about the Rhone Kingdom, Breck Kingdom, and the North though. I think I'll only be at ease if the Empire takes over the central area. As such, make sure to show overwhelming strength as you wipe them out. The Imperial Prince wanted a one-sided battle and he had prepared accordingly. However, Duke Hooten had a strange sense of deja vu. He felt that this battle wouldn't be easy, there's something going on. Rosalind, Tunka, the Whipper Kingdom, and the Flame Dwarves, they were all definitely waiting for something. What could that be? It was at that moment. Rumble. The sky began to rumble. The clear sky started to darken. At the same time, the red mana that had surrounded Rosalind instantly shot up into the sky. Duke Nim. It's a magic spell. An enormous one. What? Hooten looked up at the sky and started to frown as listened to the high-grade mage's urgent words. The high-grade mage quickly added on. This magic isn't being cast by one person alone. There is another person. An overwhelming amount of mana could be felt from where the black clouds were forming in the sky. It felt as if all the mana in the area was gathering over there. The empire's mages felt stifled by such power it was a natural response. The black cloud was made by a dragon. A cloud resembling the black dragon was made by Rosalind. W. We must avoid it. What? Hooten saw Tunka as he asked the question. He was running away. No, he was stepping back. He then heard Rosalind give an order as well. Put up the shields. All the mercenary mages who had been on the offensive started to put up shields. Hooten started to speak. Avoid it put up shields, he could see the skeleton birds soaring higher into the sky. It looked as if the skeleton birds were running away for their lives. Clack. A person covered from head to toe in a brown robe appeared beside Rosalind. The person's hand drew a vertical line from the sky downward. Hooten got goosebumps at that moment. The Empire's mages started to create shield after shield. Rumble. The roaring in the sky came to an end. And then, Hutton's world, no. The world of all those who were here became dyed red. A single streak of red, it was different from the flash of lightning. It was the true form of the fire of destruction, it wasn't a rose gold colored thunderbolt. It was blood red. A blood red flame struck the ground. Bang! A deafening roar violently shook the earth. Kale, who was the one wearing the brown robe and standing beside Rosalind, 
heard Rayan's astonished voice in his mind. Human. Didn't you say that you would only use a little bit of your power? Are you trying to collapse again? Rayan's two small front paws propped Kale's back. Kale could see Rosalind's shocked expression. He had previously spoken to Rosalind and briefed her on his plan. I'm just going to strike them with a small thunderbolt, so all you have to do is match me. Young Master Kale, you will cough up blood and faint if you use the fiery thunderbolt. I will only use a little bit this time. I can't let this power be exposed to the Empire too much and gain their attention. It was really just a little bit. He really had just thought of releasing a small thunderbolt. Kale's hands started to shake. What the hell? His body was fine. I only used a little though? Kale truly used only the smallest fraction of strength he had ever used of the fire of destruction. That's why he was just slightly hungry. However, that fire's light had dyed his vision red. A strong red pillar that seemed to drown the battlefield in a sea of blood had shot down and a lava-like heat swallowed up the spring air. The breathtaking power of the fire of destruction revealed itself on the battlefield. He heard the fiery thunderbolt's voice at that moment. Ah oh man. Why did you only use a little? I still have to pay you back for the money. The existence that had enough destructive power to turn the frozen northern part of the western continent into a sea of fire. The fiery thunderbolt that had regained its true strength felt disappointed that Kale didn't use more of its strength. This crazy bastard. Kale was so shocked that his legs almost gave out. This unfathomable and overwhelming strength slammed everyone in the back. Chapter 285. Without front or back, too, Tunka's side had stepped back. The Empire's side had retreated back as well. There was just the empty ground between the two sides that had their shields up. Fire. The fire that had shot down from heaven was burning in that space. The legend said that a god had sent down the first fire to help the people, however, this time it felt like a punishment from heaven. Duke Hooten was subconsciously clenching down hard on the hilt of his sword. Duke Nim. He could hear the shaking voice of the high-grade mage behind him. It was the person in charge of the Empire's first mage brigade. That is not magic. What? That is just pure fire. I believe it must be an ancient power. The brown robe. Duke Hooten couldn't help but think of that person. That person had been standing next to Rosalind. Ancient powers and Rosalind. Duke Hooten naturally thought about someone as he put those two together. Kale Henatus. He couldn't help but think of that name. At the same time, he remembered how the Rhone Kingdom had helped out at the Breck Kingdom's battle. It made him suspicious. At the same time, he didn't think that it was possible. If he had to name the two kingdoms that currently had a good relationship with the Empire, it would be the Karo Kingdom and the Rhone Kingdom. Furthermore, Kale Henatus had even received a Medal of Honor from the Empire. No need for useless suspicions. However, he knew he needed to be wary of that brown-robed individual. The arrogance slowly started to disappear from Hutton's eyes. On the other hand, Kale had to put some strength into his legs that almost gave out from being so shocked. His body swayed a bit. C.A. Rosalind quickly shut up as the soldiers were nearby and grabbed his arm. She then observed Kale's face underneath the robe. Huh. Kale looked fine. Forget fine, he looked extremely energetic. Here's a good comparison to what it looked like. It was similar to when a bookworm who had been studying indoors all the time decided to take a walk because it was a beautiful day. Once they come out and do some light stretching, color returned to their pale face and they looked much healthier than seconds prior. That was how Kale's face looked right now. His face that had been getting paler and making people worried had a slightly red tint to it, making him seem very healthy. Are you okay? Rosalind asked as she looked toward Kale's eyes with concern. On the other hand, Kale came to his senses after seeing the shock and nervousness mixed on Rosalind's face. He looked around. The soldiers seemed shocked and the mages seemed even more shocked. Chief Harrell had an odd expression on his face. Kale looked down below as well. Tunka was looking at him from inside the shield. Human. Are you really okay? Hum, you do seem okay, but that is weird. No. I got it. That fortification with the rain of gold must have been amazing. Rayan's relieved voice could be heard. If it is like that, let's fortify all the other ones as well. Then our human will never be hurt. He then heard Rayan's voice turn sad. Never mind. We can't do it right now. Fortification requires a lot of money, I do not have much in my piggy bank just yet. However, 
Kale did not pay attention to what Rayon was saying. Kale was looking at Tunka. Tunka was the only one who had a reaction other than shock. The bastard was looking at Kale while mouthing something silently. Are we not doing it? Smirk. Kale started to smile. He moved Rosalind's hand away from his arm and started to speak. Please start. The gaze in Rosalind's eyes changed. The pillar of fire was still burning. This pillar of fire was almost as tall as the black towers made by alchemy. It was something that was giving off an aura that made it difficult to approach. However, the lonely pillar of fire looked shabby. Put out the fire. Move the formation. Duke Hutton's voice sounded like thunder as he commanded the Empire's forces. The soldiers quickly came back to their senses and started to move their formation. They were going to dodge this pillar of fire. I don't know why the pillar of fire struck down over there, but it is useless toward us. The pillar of fire had not struck the Empire's formation. It had just hit down on empty ground. It was a useless power if it didn't kill anybody. There are many other paths toward Maple Castle. Maple Castle was located in the middle of a plain. You could approach it on all sides. It would not be difficult for the Empire's forces to surround Maple Castle based on their numbers. In addition, the number of Whipper Kingdom's warriors and soldiers were not enough to take on the large number from the Empire that could easily surround the castle. This was especially the case as only tens of soldiers and mages were on the castle wall. We just need to be cautious of the dwarves and that pillar of fire. It was just a matter of time before they won, it was at that moment. Ruumble the quiet sky started to rumble again. Ah. Duke Hooten realized something. He had forgotten about it because of the shock that was caused by this fire that they believed was an ancient power. Rosalind and the unknown person's magic. Black clouds were still covering the battlefield. Shit. Duke Nim. Duke Hooten urgently started to shout. Activate the magic shields. It was now the magic spell's turn to strike toward the Empire's forces. Just take a look. Even the mages on top of the castle wall that was not covered by the pillar of fire were preparing red fire attribute magic spells. It was so that they could protect Tunka. That red pillar was used to separate Tunka from the Empire's forces before they launched these spells. Hooten finally realized Rosalind and the Whipper Kingdom's chief strategy. That was why he was frowning as he urged the mages to cast shields as the soldiers and knights curled up together and lifted up their shields toward the sky. Ruumble. It happened once the sky stopped crying once again. Bong. Bong. Red lights started to pour out from both the sky and Maple Castle. It was different than that fire of destruction that looked like flowing blood. Fire and electric magic spells filled the area. Ah. Uh. The mage next to Duke Hooten stumbled as the ground continued to shake. It was intense. Even Duke Hooten got the chills as he watched the rose gold colored thunderbolt coming down from the sky. However, Duke Hooten was able to slowly straighten himself back up. He looked around where the magic spells had struck. Duke Nim, nobody died. None of the Empire's forces had died. There were some who were injured, but nobody was dead. However, Duke Hooten could not laugh about this situation. What, what is that? Duke Hooten could not hide his shock as he looked forward. A wall was created with the blood-like pillar of fire at the center. A furiously burning wall of fire appeared in front of the Empire's eyes. This fire with electric currents that was made from magic was burning up in the form of a wall. Duke Nim. All directions are blocked. Hooten heard the knights shout. He could see it as well. A wall of fire was surrounding Maple Castle. It looked as if nobody could enter. The Whipper Kingdom had repeated the same thing that the Empire had done in the past when they had left a wall of fire before retreating. However, one thing had changed. They didn't block all of it. They left an opening. The Empire had left the everlasting flame made from alchemy on all sides of the castle in order to prevent the Whipper Kingdom from approaching Maple Castle. However, the Whipper Kingdom had left an entrance. It was the spot that the blood-like pillar of fire and the rose-gold thunderbolt had landed. There were no fires in those two locations. Only dust was flowing around in that area. He could also see the gate into Maple Castle beyond that area as well. The Empire could try to take Maple Castle without touching the Wall of Fire if they went past that area. Ha! Ha ha! Duke Hooten let out a laugh. Right in front of the gate. In the area without fire, he could see people starting to fill that area. Tunka was the one in the front. Behind him were his subordinate warriors with the soldiers behind them. 
The mercenary mages and Rosalyn were on top of the castle wall above the gate, he could also see the brown-robed individual. The brown-robed Kale looked toward Tunka's back. Tunka felt his gaze and stood in the only opening within the wall of fire and glared at Duke Hooten and the enemies. He recalled the conversation he had with Kale prior to the battle. Kale, thank you for helping us out, but the warriors and I will fight. Chief Harrell agreed with Tunka. We just ask for your support. We will ask you to help if we are put in a dangerous situation, however, we want to try fighting with our own strength first. A fight against the Empire. The Whipper Kingdom needed to show that they could hold their own for a while. That would raise the soldiers' morales and make the Empire not try to aim for the Whipper Kingdom ever again. In addition, Harrell was planning on using this war as a chance to kill the king or turn him into a complete puppet. They needed results in order to do that. That was why they decided to fight. Of course, Tunka had a different reason for choosing to fight. That is the Whipper way. It was the Whipper Kingdom's style to fight. There was a reason that they were labeled as barbarians. Kale had smiled at the two of them. I wasn't planning on taking part in round one anyway. Tunka could feel the heat of the fire, but Duke Hutton's bloodshot eyes were still clearly visible. Kale's voice tickled his ears. I will provide you a battlefield for you to run wild. Tunka, think about a narrow and deep gorge. Kale wanted Tunka to think about the enemies coming into a narrow gorge that was filled with their allies. An extremely deep but narrow gorge, it was narrow because both sides were blocked by high cliffs. Not only that, but these steep cliffs were made of fire. Of course, fighting here at Maple Castle was different than actually fighting at an actual gorge. However, the results should be the same. The enemy will meet the Whipper Kingdom's warriors at the end of this narrow path. No matter how large the number of enemies may be, they only had one way to get through to the Whipper Kingdom's side. They had no choice but to go through this wall of fire. Tunka, if they can't get past you and the warriors, then they cannot step into the Whipper Kingdom territory. Tunka touched the pouch hanging on his waist. Kale had said that the marble inside this pouch was the ingredient for the pillar of fire used in the battle against the indomitable alliance at the Gorge of Death. The fire in the gorge will not go out. I will make it that way, so just look forward. What do you think? Is this the battlefield you wanted? What do I think? It was perfect. Tunka liked this battlefield a lot. He could feel the warriors lining up next to him, as well as the people standing on the castle wall behind him, and noticed himself becoming confident. He was not scared of the large number of enemies. They would not be able to get past this path as long as he was alive. Tunka found this battlefield to be amazing. He heard an unexpected noise at that moment. Screech the castle gate opened. Tunka saw someone coming out dressed like a soldier and standing next to him. This person was wearing a helmet. Tunka started to smile. He could tell who it was even without seeing the person's face. Didn't you say you can't use your aura? Choi Han, the helmeted man, took out a normal sword and stood up straight. Choi Han, you want to fight? We need to go heal people soon. Kale Nim, healing is important, but I think using my sword is a way to save them as well. Is that the only reason? Duke Hooden uses aura. Tunka does not have any aura. It will be difficult by himself. But you can't use your aura right now. Tunka and Kale had wondered about the same thing. Choi Han held back a laugh as he recalled the answer he gave Kale and calmly answered back. It is still better for me to be there with him rather than for him to do it alone. I am still strong without it. Tunka started to laugh. The person who could not use his aura because he needed to hide his identity, the person who had beaten him up in the past, was standing next to him right now. That was the truth. Choi Han was strong even without his aura. And that strong person was on his side. Tunka felt an unknown emotion filling his heart. Choi Han, you're my friend too, right? Shut up. Clang. The tip of Choi Han's sword pointed toward Duke Hooten as he told Tunka to shut up. Choi Han and Duke Hooten had never met before. It was because Kale had made Choi Han move separately from him in the Empire as he was worried that Duke Hooten would realize the level of Choi Han's strength. However, there was no need to worry about that. Although they were both sword masters, Choi Han's level and Duke Hooten's level were worlds apart. Duke Hooten started to shout, Third Knight's Brigade, follow behind me. The Empire's Knight's Brigade moved their horses forward as they charged toward Maple Castle with the Duke in the lead. 
Ang the Empire's mage brigade started to cast spells as well. Their mana headed toward the only entrance to the castle, as well as to the Wall of Fire. They were trying to kill everyone who was at that gap, as well as destroy the Wall of Fire. Tunka was standing in the front as he thought about the people standing behind him and he shouted wildly. You'll only get past here over my dead body. Choi Han was already rushing forward at that time. A battle between the few and the many. The battlefield that the few had wanted had been created. Chapter 286. Without front or back. 3. The Empire's Third Knight's Brigade rushed toward the only path between the fire. Get off your horses. Duke Hooten jumped off his horse as he shouted. The horses were getting scared while looking at the red fire. Anybody who was scared was useless in battle. They are more of a hindrance in that small opening. Duke Hooten rushed quickly toward the opening in the fire after quickly making that judgment. Clang. His sword, no, his aura shot up toward the sky. His silver-gray colored aura that resembled the color of his sword shot up to the sky. The Sword of the Empire. Duke Hooten had been given that title because he was a swordmaster and because the color of his aura was the color of a sword. Follow the Duke Nim. The captain of the Third Knight's Brigade gave the order and the knights who had gotten off their horses wrapped around the Duke as they headed toward the castle gate. Ah ha 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 ha. You came down to the ground in the end. It's only fun when we are on the same level. Kaha ha ha ha. Duke Hooten could see Tunka charging toward him. Once Tunka and the warriors moved forward, the soldiers behind them put up long spears and bows to cover the gap. You cocky bastard. Duke Hooten grumbled as he kicked off the ground with the aura-covered sword in his hand. Tunka and Hooten. The two of them were only looking at each other as they ran toward each other. You're just a damn arrogant barbarian. I'm going to kill you. Hutton's pride had been hurt. They kept getting toyed with by the Whipper Kingdom and even the flow of battle had changed when he was the one to come with the overwhelming numbers. He had rushed forward to change the flow of battle once again. It was also to buy some time. And finally, I will kill you. It was to kill Tunka. Tunka was now within Duke Hutton's range. Duke Hutton could now attack Tunka at a range that a stupid barbarian without aura could not reach him. He could do so because of his aura. Just like how mages and regular citizens had different values, people with aura and people without aura had different values on the battlefield as well. Ung the silver gray aura shot up toward the sky. It then shot down at a quick speed. Kill Tunka. Duke Hutton's first attack that had the desire to kill Tunka had started. I will step all over your, it was at that moment. He suddenly got the chills. Duke Hutton could feel it. An attack is coming. A sharp blade is heading my way. Hutton turned his head to the right. He could see a black helmet. This helmet even covered the eyes area so that he could not see anything about the person behind it. When? When did that? When did that person get here? I didn't sense him at all. A swordmaster like me couldn't sense him? However, he could not question it any longer. The helmeted swordsman was running like an average person toward him with an average sword in his hand. Duke Hooten quickly moved his arm that was covered in goosebumps. However, the black helmeted swordsman was faster. Ah. Hutton's body staggered, his eyes opened wide. He could see the person quickly moving toward his right side with a sudden burst of speed. How is this kind of speed possible, is he a regular swordsman? Is he an assassin? Or, is he a sword master? The silver gray aura started to come out of Hutton's sword again. He tried his best to look at the person's eyes through the completely covered helmet. It was because he knew that the Whipper Kingdom didn't have a swordsman like this. He could barely make out the eyes underneath, they were red. He could see the red pupils through the gap in the helmet. These eyes reminded him of a snake that had crawled up from the fires of hell. Hooten subconsciously thought that he could see those fires of hell behind the black helmet. He then urgently swung his arm. The silver-gray aura headed toward the black helmet. The black-helmeted swordsman, Choi Han, jumped back as soon as he saw the aura. Slash. However, a bit of his clothing ended up getting cut. As expected. Choi Han started to frown while looking at his cut clothes, he then tightened his grip around his sword. He observed Duke Hooten with his red pupils that had been colored this way with magic. Rayon, change Choi Han's eye color. We don't want him to get caught. I understand, human. Choi Han. I will make it a color I like. I will make it whatever color I want. Although Rayon had just changed it to a color he liked, 
It unintentionally had the effect of leaving a deep red image on Duke Hutton's mind. However, Hutton was an experienced swordmaster. Who are you? Choi Han answered Hutton's question by pointing his sword again. Hutton stared at the crude black helmet. This person was wearing a regular outfit instead of armor. Furthermore, he was using a regular sword without any aura. Duke Nim, I will handle him. Commanding Officer Nim, I will deal with that pest. Two of the knights who moved away from the larger battle approached the duke. However, the duke did not give any kind of response to them. His body just shot forward. Bong. Another loud noise that sounded like an explosion rang on the battlefield. Duke Hutton's eyes were full of mockery. The swords did not hit against each other. The regular sword dodged the silver-gray aura. It then slid down Duke Hutton's sword. The hilts of the two swords slammed hard against each other. Why aren't you using your aura? Duke Hutton stared at the helmeted Choi Han and asked. It could not be helped. He could not completely tell his opponent's level, however, he could make a guess after exchanging blows one time. That person is at my level, which means that they are a swordmaster. Hutton let out a chuckle. You're not going to use your aura in a battle between swordmasters. I guess you want to lose. A swordmaster was not using their aura? That was like fighting with their eyes closed. Shaw the silver-gray aura cut through the wind. Choi Han took a step back. He looked down at his sword. I guess you don't want to lose. Duke Hutton looked arrogant as he activated his aura and approached Choi Han. He looked at Choi Han and spoke with certainty. Looks like you want to die. Fighting against a swordmaster without using aura. That was the truth. That was the same as saying you wanted to die. Choi Han clenched the hilt of his sword. His red pupils focused on Duke Hutton's stance. He was observing Duke Hutton's movements. He was like a snake waiting in the grass for prey as he carefully observed each and every one of Duke Hutton's movements. He returned to the Choi Han of the past when he couldn't use aura. Duke Hutton was said to be someone who followed the typical course of an elite. He was born in the greatest Duke household of the Empire and learned from the Empire's greatest swordsman as soon as he showed a talent for the sword, with his results being that he became a swordmaster. That was why his style was elegant and full of formality. However, Choi Han's style was on the opposite end of the spectrum because he had learned to survive. He did not know of any sword arts until he developed his dark destruction sword art. He had just done whatever he needed to do to survive. Choi Han's body shot forward. Duke Hutton and Choi Han clashed once more. Choi Han thoroughly dodged the aura again, however, he was not able to land any attacks on Duke Hutton. Those useless clashes continued. You studied a refined sword art. Duke Hutton was leisurely commenting on Choi Han's attacks. He had become calm once again, as if he had never had the goosebumps earlier. Who? He then heard a sneer. The helmeted swordsman was sneering at him. Choi Han was laughing at Hutton calling his sword art refined. He then stretched his helmeted neck. Now I'm getting the feel for it. His senses had finally returned. Choi Han started to smile. The forest of darkness. His senses from back then had returned. Choi Han had decided to fight in order to help Tunka in the Whipper Kingdom. However, there were other reasons as well. He had a sudden thought after he saw Duke Hutton on the battlefield. What if I fought without using my aura? Choi Han wanted to get control of the complete darkness. In order to do that, he needed to return to when he had created this incomplete darkness. When had that been? It was when he was living in the forest of darkness. Choi Han was a weakling until he became a swordmaster. He was always living in despair and fear. However, those emotions had settled down once he became stronger. That was why he needed a situation like this. He needed to go back to when he had a weakness. Wouldn't that help him see past this wall in front of him? Choi Han charged toward Duke Hutton again. Ah, uh, ah, uh, block them. Shoot the arrows. Warriors, do not stop. He could hear the voices of the soldiers and knights fighting in front of the entrance. The Empire's soldiers and knights were rushing in like flowing water with the 3rd Knights Brigade in the front. The soldiers were pushing forward and aiming for the gate as Hutton and the Knights Brigades fought against Tunka and the other strong warriors. Do not allow the enemies to get to the gate. Feet. Tie their feet up. He could hear the Whipperside's crazed voices. They were crazy, but just from the urgency of the situation. Point the spears. Block the swords aiming for the warriors. 
Choi Han decided to go crazy from the urgency of the situation as well. He could see Duke Hooten. He could see the swordsman who, unlike himself, gave off elegance and class with every step. His senses had returned. His aura was tied down, but he still needed to kill this bastard. Choi Han started to smile. He could not see the answer, however, he could clearly see the problem. Shoot the areas. Don't let them cross over to the Whipper Kingdom territory. Cut the knight's necks. Chaos. He could hear the Whipper Kingdom's soldiers through the chaos. Choi Han believed they were in this state of urgency for similar reasons. Defend our land. The Whipper Kingdom is done for if we give up. Protect. Others will get hurt if I go down. Choi Han had not felt this sense of urgency ever since he came out of the Forest of Darkness as he had become too strong. However, he now had a home and a new family, he once again had something to protect. That was why he believed he was in this state of urgency. No I don't feel any sense of urgency at all, he figured out the identity of this wall. Choi Han realized why his progress had stalled, it was because of these voices. Choi Han. Raise your hand if you think you are about to get hurt, I will create a shield for you. Choi Han. The human says don't overdo it, activate the shields, put a shield around Pelia Nim. Rosalind Nim. Round 2 of the electricity magic is going. Fire. Don't let them put out the wall of fire, continue to use fire magic. Point the spears. Soldiers in the rear support the soldiers up front, we'll all be stomped to death if we are pushed back. Move to the back if you are injured. The rest of you, keep firing the arrows without stopping. It was because he was the only one who was not in a state of urgency. Choi Han could see Duke Hutton's sword. He seemed to have prepared properly as the aura around the sword aimed for Choi Han's openings. It was an attack that was filled with elegance. Choi Han rolled on the ground in front of that sword. He would do anything he needed to do in order to survive in front of a strong enemy. Choi Han was covered in dirt. You. Hooten was glaring at Choi Han as if he could not believe that Choi Han just rolled on the ground to escape. His gaze seemed to be asking how a swordsman who had trained in such a refined sword art could use such dirty tactics to dodge. How pathetic. He also did not miss the opening that appeared from Choi Han rolling on the ground. Hutton's sword once again aimed for Choi Han's heart. Hooten looked toward the black helmeted swordsman with ridicule. Choi Han's stance was broken because he rolled on the ground in order to dodge the aura. It was easy to catch someone like this. It was at that moment. This is why I couldn't get past the wall. What? It was the moment he heard the odd statement from the helmeted swordsman. Kihihihi, he could hear laughter. Crap, Tunka. It's Tunka. He had forgotten about Tunka. Duke Hutton's sword flinched. In front of him was the helmeted swordsman. Behind him was Tunka. There was a slight hesitation at the tip of the duke's sword, however, he decided to swing the sword as he had originally planned. This bastard comes first, he would start with the helmeted swordsman. Duke Hooten made eye contact with those red eyes behind the helmet at that moment. Those eyes were smiling. The duke flinched again. Choi Han was smiling. He could see Tunka charging toward the duke's back. Tunka was bloodied from the knights chasing behind him, but he still charged toward the duke while laughing. He could see the sense of urgency to kill the duke in Tunka's eyes. This was the problem. The problem was that he was the only one who didn't feel this sense of urgency. It was because he saw many paths to win even without doing things on his own. He could see this path when he was fighting with Kale and the others. He could see a path where it was okay even if he wasn't that strong. Tunka kicked off the ground. The iron club that was sliced in half was aiming for Duke Hutton's head. Damn it. In that slight instant that he flinched, Duke Hooten decided to turn away from the helmeted swordsman and turned his body around. He needed to get rid of Tunka first. The silver-gray aura moved toward Tunka's neck. It was at that moment, Duke Hooten heard a chilling voice. Where are you looking? Slash. Duke Hutton's body stiffened up. His eyes started to move. He could see the helmeted swordsman standing there as if his stance had not been ruined earlier. He could also see the regular sword stabbed into the side of his body. Snakes bite down on their prey without making any noises. They then release their venom. Ah! Black aura started to come out from the tip of the sword that was inside the duke's body. However, nobody could see the black aura because it was being released inside the duke's body. 
He was able to use aura this whole time, the duke could not say that out loud and the only thing he could see were those cold red eyes. It was at that moment. Beep beep he heard the sound of a flute coming from on top of the castle wall. The wall of fire around the castle prevented the enemies from attacking, however, it also locked the Maple Castle's forces inside the castle. Screech it was the white bird that had disappeared above Rosalind and Rayan's black clouds. That white skeleton bird had returned. Screech, screech. The white bird cut through the black clouds and looked down at the ground. The Whipper Kingdom's forces on the ground had locked themselves in, however, the Whipper Kingdom's forces in the air were the freest. Kale calmly started to speak after seeing Duke Hooden managing to stare at him even with Choi Han's sword stabbed into his body. Destroy the Black Towers. His voice was delivered to the dwarves on top of the white skeleton birds via the video communication device. The first battle would end soon. It didn't matter if the Empire didn't want it to be that way. Kale and the Whipper Kingdom wanted a prolonged war. This was just the first step in dragging Imperial Prince Aiden out here. There was no reason to extend the first taste. But once the Imperial Prince comes down to the edge of the Pit of Fire, a true Fire Devil will gobble him up. You'll use my power properly later, right? Kale responded back to the cheapskate fiery thunderbolt with silence. Chapter 287 Conductor 1. The white skeleton birds were crossing above the fire. Kale could feel Rosalind and Chief Harrell looking at him, however, he continued to look at Duke Hooten and the white skeleton birds as he started to speak. An orchestra without a conductor will fall into a state of chaos. He could see Hooten starting to cough up blood, Duke Nim. Captain Nim. The Empire's knights started to shout. There were also soldiers who looked anxious. Who could have expected this? Who could have expected the sword of the Empire to be defeated by a barbarian who couldn't use aura and an unknown swordsman? They were now in a state of chaos, for the orchestra that has lost its conductor. We just need to instill fear into their hearts. It didn't matter whether the melody was destroyed or not as it was over once fear was in their hearts. Kale had been pushing for battles with the lowest death count until now. He especially made sure that the innocent soldiers were not killed if possible. That was the reason for it. Priest Nim. Kale nodded his head and looked toward Choi Han as Harold called out to him. Kale gave an order to the set of red eyes underneath the helmet that were looking at him for a different reason than why Duke Hooten was looking at him. He was the other conductor on this battlefield. Whose music would sweep over the battlefield? That would depend on the ability of the conductor. Drag him and run. Rayon delivered his order to Choi Han. Choi Han. The human says to drag him and run. Choi Han started to run. His sword was still stabbed in Duke Hutton's side while his hand was around Duke Hutton's neck. Duke Nim. See, Captain Nim. The chaos had reached its peak. They could hear knights shouting from around the battlefield. All of the members of the 1st and 3rd Knights Brigades were in a state of chaos. Ah! Why, you bastards, what are you trying to do? Duke Hooten raised his hand that was still holding onto his sword and activated his aura once again even as he was being choked by Choi Han and had Choi Han's aura causing damage inside of his body. He then tried to swing his sword toward Choi Han who was dragging him. Not so fast. Ah! The wrist that was holding the sword twisted in an odd direction. Duke Hooten could see Tunka smiling after twisting his wrist. Tunka then smacked the Duke in the face. Pow! Ah! Uh. ha ha ha! You're nothing. The sword of the Empire is nothing. Tunka sneered at the bloodied Duke. He was sneering so much to the point that it was annoying. The chaos in the minds of the Empire's knights quickly turned to anger after seeing Tunka's actions. That whipper barbarian dares to mock the sword of the Empire. The captain of the 3rd Knight's Brigade who was heading toward Maple Castle's gate turned around and shouted toward the others. Save the Duke Nim. Yes, sir. Why, you barbarians. Stop right there. The 3rd Knight's Brigade started to move with their captain in order to rescue Duke Hooten, their commanding officer and the sword of the Empire. Even the 1st Knight's Brigade followed behind them at a distance after hearing their vice captain's orders. Soldiers, stay alert. The Knight's Brigade will rescue the Duke Nim and punish those two barbarians. The Vice Captain of the First Knight's Brigade who remained with the soldiers tried to rally them forward. Let's open the gate for the Duke Nim to see when he returns. Ah! The Empire's soldiers shouted as they rushed toward the narrow pathway once again. 
They looked like a tsunami made of people. Block them. Poke them with your spears. 1000 man commander Nim. The injured enemies just end up being pushed toward us because too many of them are coming at us. Resist. We need to persist until the commander gets back. Maple Castle's gate was filled with chaos. Rosalind Nim. The enemy mages are using water magic. The Empire's mages were not just standing still. They were creating water in an attempt to get rid of the wall of fire. Resist. Continue to cast fire magic. Rosalind continued to cast fire magic in order to prevent the wall from going out. Ung the highest grade magic stones slowly roamed around the top of the Whipper Kingdom's mages' heads. However, the mages were focused more on maintaining the wall of fire than on the highest grade magic stones. The enemy's water spells seemed to be endless. It was at that moment. Rosalind and Harold heard Kale's voice. Move the warriors. Harold closed his eyes. The main gate into Maple Castle. The reason that the Empire's soldiers and First Knight's brigade were unable to get through the gate was because of the Whipper Kingdom's soldiers and warriors. Tunka and Choi Han were running in the opposite direction of the main gate with Duke Hutan, however, the warriors maintained their positions by the main gate while the Third Knight's brigade and half of the First Knight's brigade chased after Tunka and Choi Han. It will be difficult for the soldiers to hold on if the warriors are moved. It would be difficult for the Whipper Kingdom's soldiers. Harold knew that this would be the case, he then slowly opened his eyes. He was smiling. He picked up a trumpet. This was the first time. This was the first time that the Whipper Kingdom's side would use a trumpet. It would also be the first time the chiefs would head out to battle. Boo the sound of the trumpet sounded over the battlefield. Tunka's left hand woman, the spear warrior Pelia, responded to the trumpet. Save Commander Tunka Nim. The warriors started to move away from the main gate as soon as she shouted. They started to run toward Tunka and Choi Han. Chief Harrell moved toward the gate at the same time before using amplification magic in order to start giving orders. Activate the first layer of defense. The gazes of the 1000 man commanders quickly changed. The Whipper Kingdom fought without much strategy involved. The Empire looked down on them because of that. They called them a gathering of fools. However, almost close to three years had passed since their first battle with the Magic Tower. Although they did not have much history, it was still enough time to set their foundation. Clang! 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 The soldiers started to activate the first layer of defense. Chief Harrell's voice sounded throughout the gate. Persist! Attack! The soldiers started to use their bows and spears to survive even with the inconsistent order. The vice captain of the Empire's First Knight's Brigade shouted at that moment. The warriors are not there. Sweep them away. It was time for them to aim for the gate. The vice captain of the First Knight's Brigade fully believed that the Empire's Knight's Brigade would be victorious even if the Whipper Kingdom's warriors went to help Tunka. Ah! Uh, just what are you planning? Duke Hutin glared at the helmeted Choi Han even as he was being dragged. The aura that was attacking inside his body was stronger than his own. The bastard who was hiding that aura was slowly running away on purpose. Duke Nim. The Empire's knights who caught up to Choi Han and Tunka created a circle to surround them. Everybody, focus on rescuing the Duke Nim. The captain of the Third Knight's Brigade gave the order. You can kill the two of them if we cannot rescue the Duke Nim without doing that. You crazy bastard. Duke Hutin tried to open his mouth and say something to the captain of the Third Knight's Brigade. Kill him? You think you can kill a sword master? They might be able to do so, but the majority of the attacking knights would be seriously injured even if they succeeded. There was also Tunka. The whipper warriors were headed over as well. Duke Hudan had to give an order to the captain of the third knight's brigade after knowing about all of this. Don't step in. That was what he needed to say. He opened his mouth to speak while trying his best to suppress the pain from Choi Han's stronger aura. Don't ah. Uh. Pow. Tunka's fist smashed into Duke Hutton's face again. He then sneered toward the Empire's knights. Forget the sword of the Empire, he's just a weakling of the Empire. Why, you damn son of a bitch! How dare you! The pupils of the knights were about to roll over in anger. The captain of the Third Knight's Brigade shouted toward Tunka who was still running in the opposite direction of the main gate even though he was surrounded. You are surrounded. Release the Duke Nim. You will be the ones to die if we fight. Duke Hutin could see the helmet heading toward him at that moment. Boo he could hear the Whipper Kingdom's trumpet. 
The red-eyed swordmaster grabbed Hooten by the hair and made him look up. Look. He could see the clear sky. And, no. Duke Hutton's pupils started to shake. He could see a large white spear cutting through the sky. It was a spear made of the five white skeleton birds. That spear was aiming for one specific spot. T. The alchemy tower. The tip of the white spear was pointed toward the black tower. Chief Canell, who was at the front of that spear started to shout. Aim for the black tower with the lion tribe. The other black towers had mages and alchemists who were focused on attacking, but the alchemy tower with the lion tribe was focused on protecting the lions. That was why they were aiming for this tower first. Although Chief Canell could not see behind him, he could feel the emotions of the four other dwarves behind him who were controlling the other birds. It was probably because they were aiming for the lions who had oppressed them in the past. That was why he clenched his fists and shouted as Edrich the lion glared at him. We can do it. Canell's body flinched at that moment. Shaw he could feel the wind touching his body becoming less powerful. He could feel an invisible barrier being created around him. It was covering his body as well as the bodies of the other dwarves. It was also covering the white skeleton birds and this entire white spear formation. Chief Canell grabbed onto the white skeleton bird's reins. He's here. That esteemed sir is here. It had happened when they had arrived inside Maple Castle with Rosalind. That was when Commander Kale had introduced them to the great and mighty individual they wanted to hide away from because of fear. Kale had said the following, he'll be there with you. The flame dwarves controlling the birds all heard a voice in their heads. Little dwarves. I will help you. They could hear the voice of a dragon. The dragon's invisible shield covered the dwarves and the white skeleton birds. Chief Canell recalled what Kale had said. Although this is an incomplete bird and not the firebird that I had in my mind, this should be enough for the first battle. The dragon will protect your wings. Chief Canell opened up the white skeleton bird's wings. The tip of the large white spear opened up. Do they want to die? Crazy bastards? The lion Edrich was feeling astonishment and contempt toward the dwarves that had not disappeared. You think you can take down our lion tribe like this? You weak bastards who only know how to serve others. Edrich and the other lion were quickly covered under a magic shield. The empire was choosing to protect the lions, the dwarves did not attack. They would get hurt as well if the white skeleton bird spear crashed into the alchemy tower. Regular bones could not destroy that tower. However, the dwarves recalled a conversation that they had in the past. Paint the bones white. White skeleton birds. However, their true identities were that they were black skeleton birds. The bones that were fortified with the necromancer Mary's dead mana were stronger than that black tower. Furthermore, the dwarves and the white skeleton birds would not get injured. Little dwarves, I will protect all of you. The dragon said that it would protect them all. This was the first time. A dragon had never protected them before. The lion Edrich started to shout. You'll only be killing yourselves, you stupid dwarves. Chief Canell shouted at the top of his lungs in return. He had never shouted that loud before in his life. Everybody around them could hear him. You dumbass lion bastards. I will make you fall flat on your asses. That shout made it difficult for the lions to hear the voice of the pale mage who was looking at the spear. A large. There's a large barrier protecting those birds. What? The alchemists and lions responded too late. Boom. The white spear pierced through the alchemy tower. The white spear and the dwarves controlling it were fine because of the dragon's barrier. The flame dwarf chief laughed at the slowly falling lions while he floated in the air with flight magic and shield magic. They he shouted once more. One more. This was just the beginning. The dwarves could feel the strength of their allied dragon and realized how strong the black skeleton birds made by a necromancer were. They did not have anything to fear. The sky is ours. The chief shouted that out loud as he opened up the bird's wings. Bong. Bong. The black towers started to fall one by one. Duke Hooten could only blankly watch it happen. However, his head was lowered before he could watch all seven towers crumbling down. There was black blood flowing out of his mouth. The helmeted swordsman was staring at him. The red-eyed Choi Han slowly started to speak. I dragged them here on purpose. Ah. The duke let out a gasp. Choi Han was saying he had drawn the 3rd Knight's Brigade and the 1st Knight's Brigade here on purpose. Hooten could see Maple Castle behind Choi Han, Boo. 
Duke Hutton's gaze lost all strength after hearing the trumpet. Magic spells were shooting up from the castle. Tens of offensive magic spells were headed out of Maple Castle. Rosalind shouted from on top of the castle wall, Everybody attack! Something had happened to the highest grade magic stones that were roaming above the Whipper Kingdom's mages who were focused on maintaining the Wall of Fire. Those magic stones let out bright lights before starting to crumble. Crackle. Crumble. The Whipper Kingdom's other strength and the past dominating strength of the kingdom. Magic. The spells of the mages who had focused on their research for tens of years shot up into the sky. They were all heading for the same spot. They were aiming for where Duke Hooten was located. The spells all charged toward that area. It was headed for this area that was away from the crumbling black towers and the battling soldiers. It was aiming for where only the Empire's knights and the Whipper Kingdom's warriors were currently located. That was where the magic spells were headed. Hooten closed his eyes. He could hear Tunka's crazed voice. There is no class or elegance in hell. War is hell. The Whipper Kingdom's spells then landed on the ground. Bong. Bong. Bang. B A A A A A A A A A A A N G. Plop. The Duke was dropped onto the ground. Once he opened his eyes, he could see the area that was reduced to ashes. Ah. The armor that was fortified with magic. Put up your shields. He could hear the desperate shouts of the knights through the explosions. Although their armor had been fortified with high grade magic stones, they could not compare to spells that were cast with highest grade magic stones and tens of years of experience. The knights who were persisting with their shields and destroyed armors were like the poor souls who had fallen into the depths of hell. However, some of the warriors were used to this kind of battlefield. Rip them all to pieces. Kill them all. Don't stop. The Whipper Kingdom's warriors. The people who had magic resistance. They responded to Tunka's shout and jumped into the battlefield that was exploding with magic. There were many volleys of spells that some were still headed over. The Whipper Kingdom's warriors who did not have full magic resistance like Tunka were also getting hurt and bleeding. However, they let out crazed shouts and laughter as they charged toward the Empire's knights. Look. All that is left in the end is the human body. Tunka shouted loudly as he grabbed a couple knights by their necks and flung them onto the ground. The Whipper Kingdom's warriors focused on killing the Empire's knights while not caring that they were using stupid and barbaric ways. They used their hands if their weapons broke while they used their heads or legs if their hands were blocked. Kill them. Tunka's shout made the warriors move into the hell like pit of fire as if they were crazy. The Empire's mages could not help the knights. They were too busy dodging the pieces of debris falling from the black towers or creating shields in order to protect themselves. Ha! Ha ha! Duke Hooten was flung to the ground and could only blankly stare at what was going on. He could not see the well-trained and classy Empire's forces. Everything was destroyed and burning. The only ones moving around were the bastards who were jumping into the destruction without caring for their lives. The destroyed conductor could only stare at the red-eyed swordsman who had defeated him. However, that swordsman was looking at his own conductor. He was looking at the only person who was still standing on top of Maple Castle's wall, the person who was standing still as if time had stopped just for him. Kale Henetus. Choi Han started to speak once Kale raised his hand. Looks like this is the end. The first battle was over. All of the Black Towers had disappeared, and the Empire did not manage to break through Maple Castle's gate even after losing the majority of their knights. Furthermore, Duke Hooten was captured as a prisoner of war. The sword of the Empire, the strength of the Empire, was destroyed. Chapter 288 Conductor 2 The Western Continent is in shock. Crown Prince Alberu Crossman was laughing from the other side of the video communication device. Kale looked at him from the military operations room as he leaned back against an empty couch. The first battle had ended. The Western Continent heard some surprising news. The Empire's crushing defeat. The Empire that was supposed to be overwhelmingly powerful crumbled before the Whipper Kingdom's warriors. Rumors of Duke Hutton's capture as a prisoner of war are spreading rapidly across the Western Continent. Aren't you laughing a bit too much? Kale turned his head away from the lively Alberu, whose glibness seemed to have spread from his tongue to his entire face. He could then see the fire of destruction that was still burning strong even after all of the other fires had been put out. Hey, 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 isn't our fire beautiful? Ah, this crazy bastard. 
Kale ignored the fiery thunderbolt's voice. He then turned his head to see Alberu's bright face once again. The Mogoru Empire contacted us. That was expected. They asked if we provided the Whipper Kingdom with mages. And? Alberu replied with a cheerful expression. I told them that I never did, isn't that the truth? That is true. Although you technically gave them a vacation. The Black Dragon Rayon shook his head after seeing Kale and Alberu's expressions. Kale didn't care about Rayon's reaction as he nonchalantly added on. The results of the Empire's battle seem to be spreading a bit too quickly though, it's strange. Alberu snorted and responded back after seeing that Kale's gaze was calm contrary to his statement about things being strange. Yeah, I spread the news. The news of the Empire's defeat, and detailed information of it at that, were quickly passed on to the, people, of the Western continent. In other words, it was spreading to the general public and not to the leaders of each kingdom. Less than half a day had passed since the end of the first battle, however, the defeat of the Empire was an interesting story in the capitals of each kingdom. Isn't this how we get the Empire to become even more panicked? That's quite superb your highness. You're as quick as a swift flying squirrel. Alberu frowned as he couldn't tell if Kale's words were a compliment or banter. He spoke to the punk who shared a similar personality as his own with a sour expression. You say that now, but you'll be going to the Empire in order to spread the news as well, aren't you? Alberu turned his gaze to the person behind Kale as he said that. Well, our sword of the Empire seems to be quite shocked, so you probably have to take care of that first. There was a man bound with all kinds of restraints and magic spells. The man showed no strength in his eyes as if he had aged a few decades over the span of a few hours. His cheeks were quivering in shock. Duke Hooten, the sword of the empire. He dejectedly looked at the white-haired Kale and Crown Prince Alberu, who was displayed through the video communication device. Choi Han, who had the dye magic removed by now, was standing behind him while keeping a close watch over him. MMFH, 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 Duke Hooten who couldn't utter a word because his mouth was gagged, nevertheless uttered a cry, or some sort of muffled groan-like sound. The Rhone Kingdom. You Rhone Kingdom bastards were the masterminds all along. How dare you bastards try and usurp the Empire's position. Unfortunately, none of his thoughts could be said out loud. Duke Hutton's eyes became bloodshot from resentful shock. However, that didn't bother Kale. A good person might have a guilty conscience, that both of them were people in positions of power who had played a role in the lives of many during the battle. Those who had blood on their hands were pretty much the same. Creek. Kale rose from his chair and saw Crown Prince Alberu gently waving his hand at him as he straightened out his priest robe. Do a good job spreading the news in the empire. Let the people know that the empire suffered a crushing defeat so that they can grumble and complain to the imperial prince. Duke Hutton's whole body trembled. He couldn't imagine anyone as evil as them. Crown Prince Alberu nonchalantly commented at that moment. That way we'll be able to destroy the alchemist's bell tower, right? Duke Hutton's body shook as if he had been struck by lightning. He could see that both Kale and Alberu were looking towards him. The white-haired Kale's voice was then heard. Don't act so surprised. We know everything, Duke Nim. Kale pointed at his white hair and uttered a single phrase. The White Star. The look of resentment and anger in Duke Hutton's eyes changed. He had a look of fear toward an unknown existence that could not be comprehended. How much do they know? No. What do they know? His mind drew a blank as he looked at Kale and Alberu. However, there was no one to answer his question. Click. Alberu hung up after saying what he needed to say as usual while Kale prepared to leave as he gave Choi Han an order. Lock him up. Duke Hooten stared at Kale as he was dragged down to the prison. The corners of Kale's lips slowly went up into a smile that seemed to resemble the smile of a holy priest. Kale arrived at the slums of the Mogoru Empire's capital with that smile on his face. Asterisk 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 the Mogoru Empire's capital. Jam, who had been walking over to open the vegetable store early in the morning, slowly stopped walking after hearing some voices. The Empire's army lost? The sword of the empire was captured? He lost to that Tunka? Jam's gaze turned toward the alley's walls. He could see some ripped papers as he heard some more whispers. I don't know for sure either, but didn't you see the notice that was plastered on the walls last night too? They said that the empire had lost. 
I didn't see it because I wasn't walking around last night. When I went to see it at dawn, the Capitol guards were ripping them all down. Last night, each and every alley wall in the Capitol had a notice posted on it. Less than the Mogoru Empire's crushing defeat greater than the contents were shocking. It didn't help that the soldiers were hurriedly taking the notices down early in the morning and that the Imperial Palace did not have any official response toward it. Were we really defeated? I don't know. Since when did our Mogoru Empire begin to only have events like this occur? The morning scenery that was supposed to be lively was rather dreary. No, it was in a volatile state. There had only been bad news ever since the terror attack on the Church of the Sun God. The people of the Empire were beginning to feel uneasy. Perhaps it was a foreboding omen of ruin. Was something big going to happen to the Empire? They say that the soldiers are looking for the people who posted those notices, right? I heard that they were scouring the area while looking for them. Jam's mouth shut tight after seeing the torn notices on the walls. He quickly started to move. There was a place Jam had to visit before opening the vegetable shop. He passed by the business district and headed for the slums while furtively scanned the surrounding area. There were many people similar to him out and about. They all looked ordinary, albeit dressed a bit shabbily, and seemed to be in a hurry as if they were all only briefly stopping by on their way to work. In addition, they all had smiles on their faces. A smile slowly formed on Jam's face as well. He slowly headed for the old but clean house near the entrance of the slums. Kriak. He opened the old wooden door. Hum. Mr. Jam. You're here. A middle-aged woman with a warm expression happily clasped Jam's hand. Jam greeted her gentler than ever. Priestess Nim, have you been well? The middle-aged woman in a white priestess robe handed over a small glass bottle with a smile. The smile on Jam's lips was bright, but it quivered a bit at that moment. Thank you, Priestess Nim. Thank you so much. Jam clutched the bottle containing the potion with a tearful expression. This would stop his daughter's cough a little bit. A rumor has been secretly circulating among the people of the slums and the slums itself for a while. Healers who cure illnesses have appeared. No one knew when or where the rumor began. However, this rumor was true. Healers in white robes appeared and hid around the capital while handing out potions or providing free simple treatments that didn't need healing abilities. That title is a bit burdensome, Mr. Jam. Priestess, no, Healer Nim, I understand. Although these healers wore priest robes, they refused to be called priests or priestesses. They also did not have a symbol inscripted on their robes to indicate which church they followed. Jam was grateful for these people. That was why there was only one thing that he could do. The middle-aged woman requested a simple favor from Jam that could easily be done. Mr. Jam, if you meet anyone who is sick or encountering difficulties, please let them know of this place. How could there be such good people like this? The healers always asked others to bring those that are sick to them. Just make sure it is done secretly. You understand, right? The empire has been a bit noisy these days, and as you know, people like us are being heavily ostracized. I know, I understand. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jam. The middle-aged woman put on a bitter smile. Who will be able to treat the sick if we are chased out? Jam's heart was full of admiration for the priestess' dedication to the sick even as he prepared for another long and tiring day of work. He bowed to the benevolent priestess and headed out through the old door. Healer Nim, I'll be careful and make sure that they don't find out about this place. Yes, thank you. Goodbye Mr. Jam. Kriak, click. The old door closed. There was no one else coming to find her. You're pretty amazing, you know. The middle-aged woman turned her head toward the source of the voice. She could see a person coming down the stairs from the second floor of the old house. It's nothing, young Master Nim. I'm just proud to be doing such good work. Kale snorted. He spoke bluntly to the woman with a benevolent smile, the assassin Frisia. I think that you were full of vitality after doing some stealthy tasks last night for the first time in a long while. Ha 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 ha, surely not. Frisia dodged Kale's gaze with a slightly awkward expression on her face. The assassin who sculpted the rabbit that resembled a guard dog from hell, did an excellent job imitating a benevolent priestess. You did a pretty good job writing the notice as well. In addition, she did a good job carrying out her original duties. The notices from last night were the works of Frisia and her subordinates. The imperial prince is probably in a bit of a fix. 
Although the attention that the empire's defeat was getting from other countries was probably concerning to the imperial prince, it also probably wasn't as concerning as the attention it was getting from within the empire. That was probably why he tried to control the release of information about the war as much as possible. However, his control was broken by Kale before he could even begin. Frisia spoke with a refreshed tone as she knew this was the case as well. The imperial prince will have to do some damage control about this war soon. He obviously had to do that. Wasn't he the one who declared war? Was that it? There was also the correspondence that he had sent to the Whipper Kingdom. The moment the Whipper Kingdom makes that correspondence public throughout the Western continent, the empire will become a laughing stock among the people. He only has two options. One is to give up the war and concentrate on stability within the empire. Frisia shrugged her shoulders and continued to speak. Or he and his army can utterly crush the Whipper Kingdom and display the empire's strength. Of course, it'll be the latter. Right? Even if the sword of the empire has been broken, its pride still remains the same. If that was the case, how could the empire crush the Whipper Kingdom? How would they bring relief to the people of the empire and steady their wavering hearts? It seems like the imperial prince will have to go on the battlefield himself. That's right. The empire needed someone more impactful than Duke Hutton. Of course it had to be the imperial prince. The assassin Frisia spoke as if she was enjoying herself. Then the imperial prince will, Kriak, the door opened. Frisia quickly stopped talking. However, she resumed speaking as soon as the door closed after seeing who it was that walked in through the door. Then the imperial prince will soon be captured at Maple Castle, right? Kale looked over Frisia's shoulder and gazed at the person standing in front of the closed door as he answered her question. Exactly. He'll be like a rat trapped in a jar. And a cat will catch that rat. Kale shifted his gaze towards the man standing behind Frisia with a concerned expression on his face. Sir Rex. Young Master Nim. Did you have something to say to me? The cat knight Sir Rex had run straight here the moment he heard of Kale's arrival. He responded to the white-haired Kale with urgency in his voice. Yes, there is something I must tell you. Follow me. Kale headed toward the second floor, and Kale and Rex soon sat down on the couch facing each other. Kale could see Rex's tightly clenched fists. He looked quite tired and had dark circles under his eyes as if he had a big concern. Sir Rex bit his lips at Kale's gaze and then started to speak. Young Master Kale Nim. Sir Rex remembered what Kale has previously said while pointing toward him. Sir Rex is the man who will defeat the Emperor and the Imperial Prince and rise to the throne. Rex had been greatly shocked by that remark. At the same time, those words kept him unable to sleep at night. The contents of the books that Kale gave him filled his head. Leadership, Public Administration, and Emperor Studies. The information that he had read after Kale told him to study were all getting jumbled up in his head. The empire seemed to be tilting away from its stable foundation due to large and small incidents. Rex had been noticing that change in atmosphere these days. That was the reason that the things that he learned were dominating his mind more and more. However, Kale, the person who could put the chaos in his mind to rest, was extremely busy so Rex could not see him until today. He slowly began to speak. I don't have what it takes to be a king. I know. Rex flinched. Kale gave a simple answer to the words he spoke with great difficulty. And I am a commoner. Someone who was neither a member of the royal family nor a noble could not become the emperor. I know. Kale answered nonchalantly as if he was questioning why Rex was asking something so obvious. Rex suddenly became speechless. Why did Kale say those things to Rex if he knew? Although I may look like a just person and seem a bit smart, I am timid and easily scared. Kale paused unnoticeably for a moment. Oh, what is this? Kale looked at Rex with a peculiar expression and began to speak. Yeah, you seem that way to me too. Rex started to frown. Then why did you choose me? Why did you choose me to become the emperor? Rex, who couldn't even utter the word, emperor, easily, was staring fiercely at Kale. He looked frightened. It wasn't the look of someone who was unwilling, but rather the look of someone who was frightened at the weight of the title. Say it in reverse. Excuse me. Rex flinched at Kale's words and asked again. Kale repeated what he had said. I said say it in reverse. Say what in reverse? Say, although I may look like a just person and seem a bit smart, I am timid and easily scared, but in reverse. 
Rex's mouth closed. Kale smiled at Rex's reaction. Rex was someone who unfairly judged himself. Sir Rex slowly started to speak after seeing Kale's relaxed gaze. Although I am easily scared and timid, I am a bit smart and. Although it was through the form of a cat, Rex was someone who had escaped from the alchemist's bell tower without being caught. He even managed to become a knight through sheer tenacity even though he was from the slums. In addition, he organized a group and aimed for the heart of the empire without any hesitation. Rex was able to finish his sentence after some time. I am a just person. That's right. That's you, Sir Rex. Rex's expression turned odd. On the other hand, Kale felt strange about this unexpected situation. How many people could call themselves smart and just? What a funny guy. Kale sat up on the couch with an unexplainable expression on his face. Either way, he came to the Empire to say what he had to say. Of course, the one he had come to talk to was Sir Rex. If you don't want to become the Emperor, you can refuse. It is okay to not become the Emperor. Kale continued to speak as Rex's eyes opened wide. However, if the alchemist's bell tower is destroyed and the imperial prince falls. If what Sir Rex and his group desires is accomplished. Then the empire will fall no matter what. It will fall into ruin. It may even vanish completely. The empire had many sins. From the Karo kingdom to the jungle and even to the Whipper kingdom. There were many who were out to get the empire. Although there was an alliance between the Rhone kingdom, the Four Kingdoms, and the One Tribe, desire was still a scary thing. Hum. Rex's expression darkened. Even he thought that would be the worst result. However, Kale just said that it was possible. It was at that moment. Plop. Rex could see the document that Kale had placed on the table. Kale got down to business once Rex's eyes were filled with confusion after seeing the title of the document. The Rhone Kingdom is offering you a proposal. It was a proposal where the Rhone Kingdom could expand its territory without going to war while giving the Empire time to stand back on its feet without being invaded by the other kingdoms. The very front page of the document was a map. Kale pointed to a spot on the map. The northwest part of the Empire and the southwest part of the Rhone Kingdom. In other words, it was the border between the Empire and the Rhone Kingdom. Kale drew a circle there. Compared to the total size of the Empire, it was a very small circle. We create a free city in this spot, a free city. A place like Lieb and City that was on the eastern continent. A free city. Kale smiled and responded as Rex asked with a blank expression on his face at the unexpected development. Yes, a free city for magic and alchemy. Rex's expression changed. Rhone Kingdom's magic and the Empire's alchemy, it was each country's most famous strengths. The fallen magic tower and the alchemist's bell tower that will fall. Kale recalled his conversation with Rosalind. Young Master Kale, it would be great if land became available. It's actually something I've needed. Kale thought about the new beginning after the destruction and collapse as he started to speak. Won't they need a new land to live in? Chapter 289, Conductor, 3. The Cat Knight, Sir Rex, did not know much about administration or politics. A land for magic and alchemy. That was why he could only imagine a vague idea of that rather than pinning down the details. What do you mean by that? It's simple. Of course, it was not a simple issue. However, Kale was thinking about it in simple terms. Magic and alchemy have a lot of similarities. The small city will have a way to protect itself if we can gather people and provide a strong foundation for them. He could hear the invisible Rayan's voice. Human. Will Rosalind get a new home? Let's build one for Goldie Gramps, too. Kale simply ignored Rayon. What he didn't know was that he would end up regretting this in the future. Rayon was being serious. Young Master Nim, why is that beneficial for the Empire and the Rhone Kingdom? For the first 20 years, the Rhone Kingdom's palace and the Mogoru side's leaders will work together to select the mayor. The mayor. It was the person with the most power in a city. Doesn't that just mean that the Rhone Kingdom wants to recommend a mayor for 20 years in order to control the city? Sir Rex was certain that, although it was called a partnership, that there would be no recommendations that were from the Mogoru side. Kale nodded his head and added on. You're right. A Rhone Kingdom's person will be the mayor for 20 years. It meant that the land belonged to the Rhone Kingdom for 20 years. After that, we guarantee that we will help support the city to become a truly free city where the citizens will have a say on the leadership. This will all be announced to the Western continent. 
Rex's expression turned odd as if he could not believe Kale. Just tell me flat out that you want me to give you some land. His voice sounded sharp and critical. Although it is called an offer, aren't you basically telling me to give you land for making me the emperor? Well, Kale crossed his legs and leaned back into the chair. Roan has the strength to do that. Kale followed that up by shaking his head. However, if we do that, the empire would disappear. Just what? The jungle, Whipper Kingdom, and Karo Kingdom. Do you think these three places would leave the empire's land alone? They will try to make deals to steal land just like the Roan Kingdom is doing, or they would start wars in order to steal the land. Sir Rex was at a loss for words. The other three kingdoms had more negative feelings toward the empire than the Roan Kingdom did, preventing Rex from antagonizing the Roan Kingdom as well. The crazy priestess Cage had already explained everything the Empire had done in the Western Continent to Rex. Then do you truly mean that you want to turn it into a free city after controlling it for 20 years? Yes. He answered without any hesitation. That's the only way for the other kingdoms to accept it. That was also the only way to get the Magic Tower and Alchemist's Bell Tower to be created in the city. Our Roan Kingdom plans to provide all of the foundational necessities and spend as much as necessary for magic and alchemy to develop in this city. Who would have something to say against it if the Roan Kingdom says they will help out until the new free city is settled and we're willing to spend a ton of money on it? They'll probably just call us stupid for spending all that money and then taking our hands away from it in 20 years. Who would believe that you would really take your hands off after that time? I'm sure that the other kingdoms will probably ask us to make a vow of death. Are you planning on doing that? Yes. Rex was completely at a loss for words. However, Kale was not done talking just yet. Furthermore, we will be on friendly terms with the Mogoru as we will be creating this free city together. That is why we will work hard to control the issues that the new Mogoru has with other kingdoms. Rex wondered if he was hearing correctly that the current rising star of the western continent was willing to be the sturdy shield for the Mogoru that was the setting sun. We will also provide the funds for the Empire's Alchemist's Bell Tower and for Alchemy itself to stand back up. Ha! Huh. Rex was shocked. He subconsciously said exactly what was on his mind. What is left for the Roan Kingdom? Aren't you just giving and giving without receiving anything back? Kale heard Rayan's voice in his mind at that moment. That's not true. You're wrong little cat knight. The human and crown prince will not just be giving. I saw the two of them laughing. Kale naturally ignored Rayan's voice. Why do we get nothing back? Well, to build a city and bring in both magic and alchemy, both of which are expensive to maintain, would cost a lot of money. Would there be anything left? Kale leisurely shook his head and answered back. It's fine. We have a lot of money. Rex didn't even have the capacity to be shocked anymore. However, the Roan Kingdom really did have a lot of money. They received money for helping the Karo Kingdom. They were also going to receive a lot of money from the defeated three northern kingdoms. In addition, the Roan Kingdom was going to trade food to the Norland Kingdom up north. They had more money than ever and also had a lot of money that should be coming in. I can't understand at all. Why would the Roan Kingdom make such an offer? The Empire would need to give up some land. This would be very painful to do. However, the things that they would get back in return were worth quite a bit. They would also not need to fight a bloody war nor have to sign a humiliating agreement. It was a deal where you gave something to get something back. That was why Sir Rex could not understand the Roan Kingdom and Kale. However, Kale recalled the conversation he had with the Crown Prince at the Gorge of Death. It was one of the conversations they had inside Alberu's tent. I wish for a larger Roan Kingdom. Kale started to speak. He could not tell someone else the complete truth. First, we will gain strength. He recalled what Rosalind had said right after the battle at Maple Castle. Young Master Kale, my former teacher told me this. The Empire is a place where everything is above average. This was something that Kale, Crown Prince Alberu, and the Roan Kingdom all knew about. Alberu's voice was going off in Kale's mind. Kale Henatus, I want to make alchemy ours. The first thing that they would earn was alchemy. Second, we will gain people. There should be a large number of people flocking to the free city, its new magic tower, and its new alchemist's bell tower. Although Kale didn't tell Rex about this, the Roan Kingdom was planning on creating a bank as one of the foundational services in the free city. They would provide funds for anybody in the western continent who wanted to learn but did not have the means to do so. 
They could later choose to remain in the free city, return home, or come to their own kingdom. Although they had the freedom to choose what they wanted to do, they would not forget about their own kingdom. The mages and alchemists who would learn and grow in the free city for twenty years would remember their own kingdom. They would be the only kingdom that offered them a home and financial support. Third is control. Ah! Sir Rex quickly understood this part. The Roan kingdom would control the magic tower and the alchemist's bell tower for twenty years. The original magic tower in the Whipper kingdom and the Mogoru Empire's alchemist's bell tower. Both of these places had done a lot of evil deeds. The Roan kingdom would try to control these two towers by using their past as justification, even if they were not the mayor of the city. This third reason was the biggest reason that Kale was moving forward with this free city. There was a low chance of Rosalind's magic tower or the new alchemist's bell tower committing evil deeds. However, both of them would be organizations with technology and power. Nobody knew what they would be like in 20 years. They needed someone to keep them in check to maintain the peace. Sir Rex started to think about the two powers that would take shelter within the free city. He knew a Roan Kingdom's person would take charge of the new magic tower while it seemed reasonable that the alcoholic alchemist Ray Stecker would lead the alchemist's bell tower. In the end, Mr. Ray Stecker is one of young Master Kales, no, one of the Roan Kingdom's people. Rex's pupils started to shake, the Roan Kingdom's influence will be strong even after removing your hands from the city twenty years later. Kale started to smile. He then calmly started to explain. Conquering territory is not the only way to expand your territory. The Roan Kingdom's territory would become a bit larger for twenty years. There were three things the Roan Kingdom wanted during that time. Strength, people, and control. The Northern Kingdoms and the jungle have a lot of territory. The three Northern Kingdoms and the jungle had significantly larger territories compared to the other kingdoms. The jungle especially had land that was multiple times the size of the empire's territories. But nobody fears or respects them. However, the empire was different. There were many places around the western continent that feared and respected the empire. That is because the empire had a lot of strength, lots of people connected to them, and worked as the control tower. That was how the empire had been until now. That was the empire of the past. Sir Rex started to think about the future. A new place came to mind to replace the empire. The Roan Kingdom. Those two words kept popping up in his mind. Their goal was not to expand their territory for twenty years. They were aiming for what the Roan Kingdom would achieve in twenty years. Kale had no issues saying it out loud. Our influence will become greater. The power to influence the Western continent. Influence was a different name for politics. It was a very strong power that was not visible, but definitely existed. The Roan Kingdom will have access to a lot of power, there will be people connected to the Roan Kingdom throughout the continent, and we would have the power to control two strong organizations. In twenty years, there would be people talking about the Roan Kingdom as Rosalind's teacher had spoken about the Empire. That is the larger Roan Kingdom we desire. If that happens, then the Roan Kingdom that was located on the eastern side of the continent would become the Roan Empire. The land of boulders would have power that rivals their sturdy and long history. The Roan Kingdom's name would spread in the hearts of the people throughout the continent. People who fear and respect the Roan Empire would exist everywhere. That was the way to expand the Roan Kingdom's territory. The benefits from the free city are not just external either. The Roan Kingdom's technology and culture would develop at an explosive rate by being near the free city. That would serve as the foundation to better the quality of life for the Roan Kingdom's citizens and change their ways of thinking. There was nothing in the Roan Kingdom to prevent that from happening. It's not like they have a national religion like the Empire. The Roan Kingdom had freedom of religion. Furthermore, it was a kingdom where all sorts or races from tigers to dark elves were gathered together. Many different things would work together in order to help the kingdom grow. All of that is possible when there is no war. They needed at least twenty years of peace. Kale could see Sir Rex slowly opening his mouth to speak. The Cat Knight slowly started to speak after seeing the look of certainty in Kale's eyes. I'm envious. He could see how the Roan Kingdom would sparkle in the future. Why? Do you think it is impossible for the new Mogoru? Sir Rex slowly nodded his head. He looked down at his scarred hands and started to speak. All of the corruption starting with the Church of the Sun God's terror incident and the terrible truth about the alchemist's bell tower and the royal family will soon be revealed. 
The alchemist's bell tower will be destroyed and the empire will lose strength. Rex slowly reached his hand out and picked up the document that Kale had handed over. Of course, we will gain a new church of the sun god and a new alchemy if we accept the Rhone kingdom's proposal. The citizens' hearts would be at peace through the new church of the sun god. The Rhone kingdom would help them maintain alchemy and prevent any foreign kingdoms from trying to invade the new Mogoru. However, that was not the issue. Rex started to frown as he asked. Do you think the citizens can still love their nation after the evil deeds of the alchemists' bell tower and the empire are revealed? Could they be proud of the place they call home? Would the empire remain the same in the citizens' minds once the royal family, alchemy, and their religion were gone? They'll feel like their home has disappeared. Rex believed that a home wasn't just a piece of land with a name. My nation. My hometown. The land that I am proud to call the place I was born and raised. That was what he considered to be a home. Would the emptiness in their hearts allow them to see their home recover? Rex had no way of knowing. Kale had a profound expression on his face as he looked toward Rex who had his head down. He was surprised at Rex right now. He's better than I expected. He was someone who knew what was important. Kale was thinking that he made the right decision by making Rex study those books and that maybe Rex was able to do everything he had done until now because he had such thoughts. That was why Kale started to speak to the knight who still had his head down. There's the real one in front of me, excuse me? Sir Rex slowly raised his head. He could see a face that was not smiling, but still had a look of certainty. The real one. Real, yes. Kale casually added on. The real pride of the empire. Rex subconsciously gasped. He heard Kale's voice at that moment. All of you have put your lives on the line. While revenge was partially responsible for their gathering, they had started everything in order to fix the things that were wrong. They were trying to let people know about the truth. Isn't that the true Mogoru? Rex felt as if he could not breathe. Kale started to smile while looking at Rex's reaction. He had dragged Sir Rex into this operation so that he could let the citizens of the Empire know about what was going on. Screech Kale stood up from the chair that he was sitting on. Sir Rex looked toward him with a complicated expression as Kale pointed to the document in Rex's hand. You can reject the offer. It is an offer because that is possible. Bang, bang, bang. Loud noises suddenly filled the room. Kale looked toward the entrance of the second floor. Bang, bang, bang. Someone was banging on the door. W. What is it? Sir Rex jumped up in shock. A voice responded from the other side of the door. Young Master Nim. It's me, Billows. It was the Flynn Merchant Guild's Billows. He seemed to be gasping for air outside the door. There was a sense of urgency in his voice. What is going on? Kale walked up to the door and grabbed the doorknob. It was at that moment. Human, human. We have a message from the crown prince. A message was left on the video communication device. Kale flinched after hearing that it was from crown prince Alberu and stopped turning the doorknob. Young master Nim. However, Kale ended up opening the door in the end. Billows, who seemed to have rushed over, couldn't even catch his breath as he started to speak. Young master Nim. The Imperial Prince and the Vice Tower Master of the Alchemist's Bell Tower are supposedly heading to the western border. Kale's face brightened up. However, it immediately turned to a frown as if he was a wet tissue that was crumpled up. Human, the message says that, the Imperial Prince asked for reinforcements. Rayan's voice could be heard in Kale's mind. He also said, Kale Henitus, the Imperial Prince is looking for you. Human, why is the Imperial Prince looking for you? Damn it. Now what the hell is going on? Kale's frown became even deeper. Chapter 290. Playing the drums in the Jonggu, doing everything, one. What else could it be? Crown Prince Alberu's bright smile was visible on the other side of the screen. You're screwed. Ha! Kale brushed his face with both of his hands after seeing Alberu smile while saying that he was screwed. Alberu seemed to be enjoying this right now. On the other hand, Sir Rex and Billows had turned pale. Their gaze was on the black dragon who was patting Kale's leg. Human. Do you not want to see the Imperial Prince? Cheer up. Pat pat. Rayan's chubby front paw continued to tap on Kale's leg. Sir Rex and Billows just turned away in shock. It's a dragon. I really did find a golden thread. 
Billows was mumbling, but nobody was paying any attention to him. Alberu just chuckled and shook his head. This is bad. The Imperial Prince is asking for you. As an honorary citizen of the Empire who received a Medal of Honor, shouldn't you go? Damn it. Kale held himself back from saying that out loud. But it really seems like the Imperial Prince is in a rush. He needs you to put out the fire. That was the reason. The Empire was looking for Kale because of the fire. The fire that Kale's fire of destruction had started in front of Maple Castle was still burning strong. The Empire knew about the Pillars of Fire in the Gorge of Death. Seeing as how Rosalind, who had been at the Gorge of Death, was with the Whipper Kingdom's forces, they were worried something similar might happen to them. That was why they were looking for Kale who had put out the jungle fire. It's not like I can say no, Kale commented as if he was sighing. Um. Why can't you say no? Sir Rex cautiously asked. Kale shrugged his shoulders and started to explain. They will start to get suspicious if I don't go. They'll think that the Rhone Kingdom is supporting the Whipper Kingdom. The Mogoru Empire was already pressuring the Breck Kingdom. The Breck Kingdom keeps telling them that Rosalind has long been kicked out of the royal family, but that only continued to fuel the Empire's suspicions. Of course, they couldn't officially do anything as nothing was proven. Um, it puts you in an awkward position. That is the case. It was when Rex, Kale, and the Pale Billows all nodded in agreement. You don't have to go. Excuse me? Crown Prince Alberu did not hesitate to say that. Miss Rosalind had some precious footage. Precious footage? Yes, and I have a copy of it too. He understood once I showed it to him. What could it be? Kale felt chills on his back for the first time in a while. However, Crown Prince Alberu was calm. Miss Rosalind recorded you suffering on the bed in the Eastern Continents Inn. Ah. Kale started to frown. Suffering on the bed in the Eastern Continents Inn. That was when he had been coughing up blood and shivering after earning the sky eating water. Ron had shown Rosalind a short glimpse of his suffering when she had called. When did she record that? More important, why did she record that? Rayon shouted as Kale's face filled with shock. I didn't see that. My eyes were closed so I couldn't see it. Rayon Nim, it has been erased. Erased my ass. Both Rosalind and Alberu still had the footage, however, Alberu brushed it off like this while knowing that it was not something to show to a six-year-old, even if that six-year-old was a dragon. Rayon had not been able to see Kale in pain because he could only hear things at that time. That's too bad. Kale watched the conversation between the crown prince and the dragon with disbelief. Alberu made eye contact with him at that moment and happily added on. I told the Imperial Prince you are in recovery and in a lot of pain. He seemed to be so shocked and said that he hopes you survive so that he could see your smiling face again. Alberu did not like that footage at all, but could not forget the Imperial Prince's shocked expression. Anybody would find it to be shocking. I understand what kind of sacrifice the Rhone Kingdom's hero had to make in order to protect the Rhone Kingdom. Alberu had responded back to Imperial Prince Aiden's comment. We can't ever forget about all of his sacrifices. That is why the Rhone Kingdom plans to protect Commander Kale Henatus and let him focus on his recovery. I understand. I would do the same thing. Alberu added on to the frowning Kale. So you don't need to worry about the Imperial Prince. He would never imagine that you would be helping the Whipper Kingdom. We can't do that. Crown Prince Alberu flinched and looked toward Kale. The corners of his mouth were slowly going up as if he had never been frowning. Alberu could not help but ask after seeing that expression. You're going to go? You're going to the Empire's side in order to see the Imperial Prince? Yes sir. Ho. Kale heard Alberu's shocked gasp but he was calm. What would the Empire think about me if I went to help the Empire even when I was in so much pain? They would think that he was not just an honorary citizen, but someone who truly loved the Empire. You sly bastard. Kale simply turned away and looked toward Billows. Billows seemed shocked, but Kale coldly asked a question. Billows, when are they saying the Alchemist's Bell Tower's Vice Tower Master and the Imperial Prince are planning on leaving? Billows recalled the information he had heard and quickly answered back. Within the next week, young Master Nim. That's what I would guess based on how they were packing the supplies. He had used his network as a merchant as well as bribes in order to find information on the military supplies when he had learned about this. It was not a secret. It is supposedly already decided and they will soon announce it. 
They need to calm the hearts of the citizens after all. Only the alchemist's bell tower's vice tower master is moving? Yes sir, but obviously alchemists are going with them. Kale and Crown Prince Alberu made eye contact. We never seem to see the tower master. That does seem to be the case. The tower master of the alchemist's bell tower had never publicly shown himself after taking on the disciple from the slums. Either way, isn't the vice tower master the actual leader of the bell tower right now? I believe so. That person will be out of the capital during the war. Kale responded back. It'll be an empty house. Although they didn't know where the tower master may be, the effective leaders known as the imperial prince and the vice tower master would leave the capital. Well, the emperor would still be there. Kale turned his gaze toward Sir Rex. We need to loot an empty house. Flinch. Sir Rex could not help but shiver. It was at that moment. Are we looting again? We always loot whenever we come to the Empire. Let's just loot them all. Silence filled the room after the six years old dragon's shout. Kale held back a sigh and shook his head. It's not like that. Human, it's not. Yes. Then what is it? Kale put a hand on Sir Rex's shoulder and gently patted him as he started to speak. Let's kneel for a bit. Excuse me. What? Rex's pupils were shaking, however, Kale's pupils were firm. Gather some people. Excuse me. I will send you the signal within a week, so gather some people who'll be willing to kneel. What? They needed to make the move when the self proclaimed owners of the empire were not present. They would take the first step to destroy the bell tower by having these average or poor citizens kneeling in front of the alchemist's bell tower. And you know the path, right? The path? Kale answered with a serious expression after seeing Sir Rex become flustered at this incomprehensible flow of conversation. The path you took to escape from the alchemist's bell tower. Sir Rex's face stiffened up. That path. That dirty and scary path that he had escaped through in his cat form while leaving his sister and brother behind. It was one of the underground sewers coming out of the alchemist's bell tower. There were a significant number of corpses in those underground sewers. I'm certain that you remember that path. The path to secretly enter the alchemist's bell tower. Of course, Rex still knew about it. He had gone back to that path when he made up his mind to get revenge for his siblings and reveal the truth to the world. He had gone back to that path before he made up his mind to become a knight. However, there were now guards watching the sewers, while the path had become even narrower and had been blocked with iron bars. He could not fit anymore after growing bigger in the past few years. He had hated himself at that point. He thought that he should have come a bit earlier. He might have been able to see his sister and brother one more time if he had done that. I cannot fit there anymore even in my cat form. It doesn't matter. It will be narrow for your two cats as well. That's fine. Kale confidently answered back to Sir Rex's concerned expression. Wouldn't a rat fit in there? I suppose so? Then that's enough. Kale knew a rat who was a coward but listened to his orders well. The mixed blood dwarf rat Muller. He was able to transform into a rat form even as a mixed blood dwarf rat. Alberu interjected at that moment. You must be Sir Rex. Your Highness, Alberu knew Rex's face but had been pretending not to know until now. Rex still had the Rhone Kingdom's offer in his hand. Crown Prince Alberu put on his majestic princely smile on his face. Just relax and think about it without feeling any pressure. Nobody is forcing you. Your Highness. Rex had a complicated expression on his face after seeing the majestic but warm smile on Alberu's face. He then lowered his head and responded back. There are many issues, but the royal family is the biggest issue. Rex raised his head back up and looked at Alberu's hair through the screen. Alberu's hair was a beautiful blonde color that resembled the sun. I don't know if the Empire's citizens would accept someone like me who does not have the golden hair. Alberu had an odd smile on his face. The Rhone Kingdom's Crossman royal family had been known to have the sun god's love since a long time ago. Their blonde hair was the symbol of that love. That golden glow was the symbol of royalty. I guess the empire does puts emphasis on gold as well. The Mogoru Empire had the Church of the Sun God as their national religion and had a story similar to that of the Rhone Kingdom. Less than the bloodline of eyes that glow gold underneath the sun greater than. That was the symbol of the Mogoru Empire's royal family. Eyes that glow only underneath the sun it didn't matter what color their eyes were most of the time. However, 
the fact that only glowed gold underneath the great sun had been a reliable source of support for the royal family. Billows chimed in at that moment. But hasn't that symbol existed much longer in the Rhone Kingdom? The Rhone Kingdom had the longest history on the Western continent. That was why the Rhone Kingdom's citizens like Billows believed that the symbol of the sun had originated from the Rhone Kingdom before it was stolen by the Empire. Sir Rex. Yes, your highness. The outside does not matter, while history is meant to be changed, there is no need to linger in the past. Rex bit down on his lips after hearing Alberu tell him that his outer appearance was not important, he became energized hearing this prince who seemed to fit the position better than anybody else trying to cheer him up. No need to linger in the past. Rex repeated that statement in his mind. On the other hand, Alberu made eye contact with Kale and shrugged his shoulders. It was ironic because Alberu was the quarter dark elf who cared more about the outer appearance than anybody else and was hiding his true appearance. Kale slightly nodded his head toward Alberu. What Alberu was saying to Rex was something that he was telling himself as well. Kale started to speak once the room became silent. Then I will hang up now. I am busy, your highness. He truly was busy. He needed to hurry up and prepare before heading back to Maple Castle. Asterisk 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 pot. Kale stepped out of the teleportation magic circle once the bright light had disappeared. Young Master Kale. Kale Nim. He could see Rosalind and Choi Han standing there. Chief Harrell was with them as well. Rayon was naturally in his invisible state. Rosalind urgently started to speak. Young Master Kale, I heard that the Imperial Prince and the Vice Tower Master were heading here. But are you really going to the Empire's side? Are you going to help the Empire? Rosalind quickly stopped talking after seeing the gaze in Kale's eyes. His eyes looked serious. She could see a glimmer of his blood like red hair even though it was currently white. Yes, I will be going to the Empire. Rosalind opened and closed her mouth a few times after hearing Kale's response before finally managing to speak. I thought you were going to show the Empire a sea of fire? Her voice sounded shocked as she asked, but you are also going to put out that sea of fire? Kale was the one to start the fire. Kale would also be the one to put out the fire. Rosalind couldn't really understand it. Choi Han was not talking but his pupils were shaking. Kale was flabbergasted himself but answered after a long time as he had no choice. Yes, I am doing it all. He would play the drum and the jonggu. This is a Korean idiom about how one person does everything. Usually you have one person playing the drum and one playing the jonggu, a Korean instrument, but in this case he would play both, which means he is doing everything, hence the title, he would play every single instrument in the damn band. 